Hi, I'm Jim. And I'm David. And And this this is the Practical Practical Guitarist Guitarist Podcast. Podcast. The podcast for people who eat, sleep, and breathe guitar. Practical Guitarist Podcast is brought to you by Great Lakes Guitar Pickups. Great Lakes Guitar Pickups provides fantasy tones at prices a practical guitarist will love. Featuring top-notch construction, attention to detail, and a fully custom product, if you can dream it, Great Lakes Guitar Pickups can probably build it. Follow them on Facebook at facebook.com slash Great Lakes Guitar Pickups. Are you a regular listener? Why not? David here reminding you of all the ways you can participate in the Practical Guitarist Podcast. Subscribe using your chosen podcast app. Review us on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or Google Play. Find our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Practical Guitarist or on Twitter as at Pract Guitarist. Support the show. Merchandise is available in our Threadless store at practicalguitaristpodcast.threadless.com. And donate to us via Patreon, available at patreon.com slash practicalguitarist. Reach out to us directly via email at questions at practicalguitarist.com. Hi, Jim. Hi, David. Hey, John. Hi, Steve. Hi, Dan. Hi, David. Hi, Dan. Um, I gave Dan. I gave Dan. The, I gave Dan the nice eye. Like, mm. uh, I, Dan and I have a very special friendship. Um, he and I will be sharing a space at uh, at uh, Gearfest this year. Um, so, no, he's my cameraman. Okay, like I, we were already talking about it. So, um, yeah, I was going to ask about that because we're um, those of you who uh, are in the chat. Um, if you don't know, uh, Dan knows because he's already in. We're got, we're getting a room. We're getting a room. Oh wow! And, uh, so uh, well, a house, and yeah. so um, uh, we're going to bed and bath. And so uh, uh, Dan is going to be with us, and um, at Gearfest, and it's just kind of funny because uh, I was going to ask who is going to be sharing a room because I don't know. We don't know who's sharing a room. I really don't I give a shit. I'll, I'll probably crash on the couch. Anybody looking at my junk? I'm sorry. I'm old. <laughs> exactly. It's going to be a house full of men, so it's going to. Don't be- care. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, and former amazing. Navy, no I, less. Um, <laughs> I've seen enough of those floppy wieners. Yeah, I floppy wiener, floppy wiener. And moving on. Um, so, <laughs> so we're all gathered here today. To worship in the light of our holy podcast. No, um, we have hit 10,000 downloads of The Practical Guitarist. So we yeah. invited uh, friends to join the show. Um, that's why Dan, John, and Stephen are here tonight. Um, this is a big, big deal. Jim and I were just discussing with uh, the rest of the lads here that uh, this has happened relatively quickly. We yeah. hit around December. I think it was the beginning of December. We hit 5,000 downloads. And now we're at 10,000, which yeah. means that we have in within less than a year, within way less than a year, four months, we have almost doubled our downloads and we've cut the amount of episodes we're producing in half. Yeah. So whatever you guys are doing to share this episode with your friends, tell people about us. Uh, I appreciate the effort. So does Jim. So they, yes, very much. We love giving back. Uh, so that's why we're having this episode. Um, we don't have any prepared topics tonight, but no. we could probably talk about some. some no, stuff. so we'll we'll be looking to our our gallery of peanuts um, later on for things to talk about. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we're going to be at Gear Fest this year. Um, uh, David has already booked the uh, the space, and um, so we know where we're going to be. Uh, we're going to be doing some jamming there. We're going to be having some fun. I, I kind of look I, I look forward to it. There will be do we're going to be staying in a tiny little house like it lo- it looks like a trailer it's, it is a house it is a very small bungalow or whatever it's it's like my house it's a little bungalow yeah and then we will we will be there and there will be um jason Voorhees that shows up and murders us all at night yep. um i may be the only survivor because i probably will have a gun with me uh just in case 
There's a lot of gear in that place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's Indiana. You're basically required by law to have a firearm down there. <laughs> Fort Wayne. No joke. No joke. This is the rule in Indiana for concealed carry. Go to the driver's license, which is called the BMV, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, and you apply, and they give you the thing before you walk out. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> Virginia is the same way because I looked into because I'm getting a pistol, right? So I was looking into my concealed carry and same thing. It was like, yep, you just go down and it, it's a couple minutes and you're out with your concealed carry. Actually, you guys, I don't know how everybody feels about firearms. It's a political thing, but like I just want to point point out that um, I part of the reason why, like the only reason why I've even considered getting a concealed carry permit is because of the Craigslist deals. Um, I have dealt with some incredibly shady people, like just selling gear, um, you know. And and I have a habit of like putting a baseball bat or something in the trunk of my car and keeping the the stuff I'm giving them in the trunk, so that when they come over there, like if anything goes south, like I. I at least can protect myself because it's, I mean, there's some ugly people out there. There's some ugly stuff going on. I can um, tell you that every single person I've met from Facebook marketplace where I've sold something to them and I met them in a, in a well lit daytime public place and they all had concealed weapons. Everyone. Oh yeah. But you're in Virginia. Like up, up here, we don't know if they do or not. And chances are, so that's the other thing is like, just because you're going to live in a state where concealed carry is hard to get, doesn't mean everybody isn't packing. Like I can, I can tell you, I've been in stores where people are like, they've said to me like, yeah, it's okay. I, I, I can handle it. You know, it's like, yeah. what? Well, I used to live in New know. York and in upstate, you know, we're not, we have to live by the same rules as the people in the city, almost, almost the same. And unfortunately in upstate New York, you know, we're, we have bear and we have, we have real things to consider. Yeah, dude. Real reasons that we have. Yeah. Help. Yeah, you know, 457 K stool for that bear over there. I grew up with <laughs> guns my whole life. It was yeah. just, it was just something that was in the house. So well, so that's another thing. Like guitar is a um because it's become such a, a worldwide instrument, really as a result of, you know, kind of the British bands and stuff. Like before that, the electric guitar was a pretty American thing. Yeah. Um it was, you know, for me, and, I, and I'm speaking specifically of the, the era right before like Fender started hitting England and people like Cliff Richards started championing the electric guitar over there. Right. But like before that, it was like Buddy Holly here and people like that. And, and really some of the, some of the earlier country guys, um, uh, I'm, God, names are escaping that like Carl Perkins and people like that. Yeah. But I mean, um, we, we tend to think of our, our instrument as being, um, devoid of you know any of that kind of political flack or whatever but there was a time where when you looked at a guitar there was a very good chance that it was being frowned upon in the early days i mean oh, electric guitar definitely matter of fact um uh i, I think i told the story before bob dylan got booed off stage uh, when he went electric when he went electric and it was such a big deal just because he was i can't remember if it was a strat or a telly i know it was one of those two i want to say it was a strat it might have been a telly, but um, for some reason, my brain is telling me it was. All right. Well, all I know is he did that. For our participants this evening, I have a question. Uh, you, you raise your hand if you want to answer or whatever. But um, what I wanted to ask was, have you ever had a guitar that was like too outside the genre of what you were doing or was like one of those guitars that people would frown upon and be like, that's kind of gimmicky kind of situation? Has anybody had anything like that? No, no. I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of, a lot of head shakes here. No. I, will, <laughs> I have. <laughs> <laughs> I had, um, for a while, I had an Ibanez Destroyer. And it's, it's an Explorer style guitar, right? It's a big, big guy. And unless you're playing like Kiss, like that's the, that's really like what the air, the area where you get into music, maybe like Def Leppard, stuff like that, like 80s hair metal acts. And and then maybe modern metal as well. Like those are acceptable genres to use it in. But I wasn't playing any of that music at that time. <laughs> I was playing like Led Zeppelin through it. And it's not outside of the realm of craziness, but it's one of those guitars that people look at we kind of look at you funny. He's like, Really, you're playing that. I took my <laughs> SG church and that was a um I got a few looks for that. Um believe Seriously, it or not. For the devil yeah. arts. 
Yep, yep. I, I took it to church. Everybody loved the blue, as you can see. It's beautiful blue. But there was a little bit of get a get a pick guard that you can just throw on it right before the right before you go in with a cross on it. It'll it'll fix everything. <laughs> Put the cross <laughs> Just down. make sure just make sure that it's oriented so that when you're holding the guitar and playing it, the cross is facing the right way. Because I could see like the cross being like the wrong way on the pick guard, and then like you go to play it and it's upside down or something. <laughs> that would not be that would not be good. <laughs> that would be the opposite of good. <laughs> that would be getting in trouble. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I did the I did the the uh, demo of the ritual, right? And I don't know if anybody here's watched it. But if you haven't watched it, go check it out. It's on YouTube. Um, and that was that was loaned to me by a show listener. Um, Jason Fuzzmonger, and uh, I got at least a couple of like side eye looks from people when they were watching the video, and and I and I was kind of interested as to see what would happen because it has a picture of Jesus on the on the uh, the pedal, and he's wearing the crown of thorns, and listen, like but he has no eyes. Honestly, like I would totally I would play that in church, like I you know I would listen. I know some people would look at that and be like, oh, that's terrible. It, Jesus wore a crown of thorns because the Romans forced it on him. Why is that awful? Like, that's mm-hmm. that kind of fits the liturgy. <laughs> no, no, maybe, it, it, yeah, Stephen, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So I can tell you, like, there wasn't really a guitar that I owned that I thought, what, now that I look back on it, was like, I shouldn't really why am I playing this? But the one that I wanted when I was like 15 was uh, a comparison Horus. And it's like a 27 fret, you know, shred guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The devil's horn headstock. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was like totally like out of the blue. Now that I look back on it, it's like I still like secretly want one of those because it's a guilty pleasure. Just get it and hang it on your wall. Yeah, yeah. Put your crucifix right underneath it. It'd be great. Right. I thought about playing one in church or something like that, and somebody would be going like, looking at the devil's tail headstock and going like, "Yeah." Uh, there was um, <laughs> there on a classic episode of Sixty Cycle Hum, there was what I would consider to be an unchurchable pedal, and that was um, well, there's been a couple, I guess, in history overall, but they they somebody had scratched, and I can say this on our episode, so. If you got kids, please just turn the volume down for like 15, 20 seconds while I say this. But the pedal had had like fuck scratched into it. <laughs> and it was like, I mean, it was ridiculous all over the pedal. And yeah, I don't think that would be necessarily something that, you know, you would want your, uh, your worship leader to see while you put it on stage, you know. Um, if you're going to do that, I would recommend that you do that and have that as the only pedal you put on stage. Just put it down like no pedal board, just two cables, power, done. <laughs> yeah, there was one that they had on the, I don't remember if it was 60 cycle, I'm pretty sure it was, that somebody had posted that had a, um, a naked woman on it. Yeah, that's and the kind I, of stuff that's unchurchable. I mean. Yeah, you don't take that. And, and yet you had people going, oh, well, you know. I, I'm not even going to get into that. That was, yeah, that's a whole other thing. And that's their opinion and let them have it. Um, so, so Dan, you would play that anywhere, huh? Dan, Dan doesn't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's going to, yeah, gonna I, would, that. I wouldn't care at all. Period. <laughs> You're talking about I'd the play that in the goddamn grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we talked about the uh, that that special pedal from uh, Steel Panthers guitarist uh, Sashel. Um, that would probably be one that would probably trip some uh, some worship leader sensors right there. <laughs> but what, what I would recommend is if you're going to do that, cover the just just cover the bandboard with tape. I've seen that before, and it's hilarious because it's like you know what it is. Everybody else in the worship band knows what it is. You know, it's like mm-hmm. who cares. Um, just just yeah, cover exactly. the tape and write Pepsi on it. So it's oh, that's tape. even better. Pepsi Melter is that like is that like a Michael Jackson joke? A little bit. <laughs> oh, and I'm not sure. I'm, I'm yeah. glad we're uncensored. <laughs> All right. So yeah, lately, so there's some controversy that's that's definitely not in the guitar community, but it's definitely in the music community has been the whole Michael Jackson and that special that that came up recently. Um. 
and I'm not going to touch it with a 10 foot pole, by the way. Um, you know, I, I just, people who suddenly go, oh, the music sucks because he was an awful person um, who spent 30 years loving the music or whatever. You got to, I, I don't know. I just, you love the music. You don't have to love the person. You know, they, there's an old saying. Yes. You love the sinner. You don't love the sins. Let's, and, let's, let's take a step back though. And let's talk about, so the psychology of what happened with Michael Jackson, whether or not, yeah. you, if you don't believe he was a child molester, you exactly. certainly can look at his life and say, wow, that guy was kind of a mess. He had oh, a lot yeah. of problems. He died. He died of a drug overdose. I mean, it, it, it was induced by a doctor. Right. So there's like a whole multitude of like mess here. But what I'm really wanted to talk about um, and, and have like specific discussion about is that many of these creative people that we all follow have like these personal inner demons that are, they, they haunt them and oftentimes end up with their demise. And, right. and like you're Michael Jackson, right? Uh, Freddie Mercury to some extent. Um, yeah. Not so much his demise, because I think that could have happened to anybody, but it was like one of those things where his promiscuity in, in both communities he was involved with uh, ca caused an issue there. Um, and, and then you've got people like uh, um, Janis Joplin drinking herself to death and uh, Jim Hendrix. Morrison, of course, overdosing and, and Jimi Hendrix overdosing. Like all of these different people um have these demons that are that are haunting them and they're all and now the question is are they legendary because they died in their prime or are they legendary because of the art they produced now i think that's debatable but we all know that michael jackson hadn't done much in 10 years prior to his death so it's pretty clear he was legendary slash iconic long before his passing right um but as for the you know these other people i think i think there is like an air of to have that critical genius and to be, you know, to have that vision that drives you forward, you almost have to have like an imbalance in your personality or somewhere else you've got something else. It's just a complete mess. Um, yeah. So yeah, you've got to be a completely messed up human being sometimes to come up with this stuff. You know, you hear about people who, um, let's face it, Aerosmith sucked after they got, after they got clean. I mean, <laughs> they were awesome when they were stoned out of their freaking minds. It's, <clears throat> and it's an unfortunate byproduct or a fortunate byproduct for the fans, and an unfortunate byproduct for the individuals. Well, I think it's, I think, so the Aerosmith argument is kind of funny because I think, so when they were stoned out of their mind, they were hiring a lot of people to do this stuff for them. And, and that's now been personally documented. And then and they get yeah. sober and also they start playing on their own records and they're not as good. Well, I'm not talking about the record. I'm not talking about the playing. Um, I'm talking about the, uh, um, the, level the quality of music that was well that's different. what i'm talking about like the songwriting and all that stuff suffered it wasn't it wasn't as though like they flipped right. a switch and suddenly you know they came out doing the same stuff it was almost like a different band at that point and i think right. it was i don't think it was necessarily a change in personality so much as they didn't have the same people contributing to the writing table because they didn't need to they didn't need to lean on a producer as hard they didn't right. need to um and maybe they had the clarity of thought to fight the producer on things they shouldn't have, you know, right. it, it, that th those are, um, that's all I'm getting at, but it did change things. You're absolutely right. Like the output right. of music it, it, and critical theory. I'm, I'm an English major by, by trade. When I was in college, we, we studied critical theory. That was a big, big chunk component of what I studied and what a lot of critical theory um, scholars do is try to separate the work from the author. Okay. And that's essentially the same thing we're attempting to do here, which is to say the music is its own entity and you don't have to judge the music based on what its author was doing. Right. It might clue you into it, but it's not necessarily necessary that necessarily necessary. It's not needed to understand the content. That came from an English major, the necessarily necessary. Yes, yes, it did. Uh, I don't use my English major skills very often. I work in computers, so um, <laughs> yeah. It actually does help for the computer trade, by the way, which is very surprising. So, so I've been listening a lot to recently this uh, YouTube channel called Twelve Note, which is very interesting. If you want to do, if you want to learn anything about, I'm not talking about like normal everyday music theory like there's 12 notes and there's fourths and fifths and stuff like that they get into the crazy He's stuff talking about the stuff that is way out there like um, total serialization yes and 72 notes in a scale and yeah like, yeah I was listening to, yeah 
microtonal scales and things like that. And I was, I was listening to um, uh, even temperament and all this other stuff, really cool stuff. If you're interested in it, definitely a channel we're checking out. I think so I, today I was on um, uh, jumping uh, uh, off of that. Cause that's, that's just kind of a plug for those guys. Cause I think that they're really cool. Um, <clears throat> uh, today I was on um, with uh, Vernon Reed. You know, that was great people. And so it was really cool. Cause you got to ask Vernon Reed a question. Um, looking forward to trying to get him on the channel. We're what gonna... did you ask him? Nothing. I, was watching I, just he, I just thought he was great. <laughs> oh, because I was like, yeah, we got they to ask some questions, me. but I didn't hear yours. <laughs> yeah, they, they mentioned me, but um, I they mentioned you twice. I heard. Yeah. And um, uh, who was it that uh, um, answered? Oh, Richie or, or uh, Frank Richie answered a question of mine and uh, somebody else. Yeah. I. Oh, and the, and the uh, great. Oh, a great yeah. interview because yeah. he's a Helix user, but they didn't focus on the Helix. They were talking about photography and like. Right. It was great. It was, to, it was get, again, it was kind of getting to know Vernon Reed as a person um, outside of, of that. Did you know he was like that super artistic, overeducated? Like, I kind of figured as much. He's, he's out there. Like, yeah. he's one of those guys that, like I said, people who have personal demons. I don't know that he has personal demons, but he's definitely a guy that like is buried in books yes. and probably is not that social a person. Yeah. That's, that's my, my, he was talking about gaming, video gaming, and he was yeah. talking about how he has to, <laughs> he has to go, okay, I can only do so much because otherwise I'll go crazy. Yeah. He's well, and he's a guy that strikes me as like a total workaholic, which is yeah. why you know, why he knows all that he does. And so, I mean, he's talking about doing stuff with the Helix. And I'm like, dude, I, I play with the Helix, like probably five, six hours a day, you know, some days. And I'm like, I haven't even scratched the, the surface of what you're doing. You know, <laughs> how much yeah. time are you spending with this thing? Yeah. Was Maybe really you think good. about the rest of his rig and all the other things he's got going on. You're like, how could you possibly know that? Yeah. You know, he, hey, he, he, yeah, he was talking about, yeah, he's, really involved with the microcosm part of his rig, like each little individual piece. He's talking about Chase Bliss, talking about the Roland BG-99. Yeah. He's talking about the, um, uh, the Helix. And he's trying to get all this stuff to talk to one another and do all the things that we do, yeah. um, but on a much grander scale. Yep. Um, MIDI, MIDI triggering the Helix to to grab the vg99 and do things to it yeah and then also to to control ableton live <laughs> yeah and i'm going no dude no <laughs> just no sometimes, that's what he said too <laughs> yeah sometimes you gotta just to say no step back step back and just be like all right this is enough yeah. um you know i i think that actually is a cool topic that we probably should talk about so so um of our group here i think everybody except for john has like a ton of experience with different modeling devices um you know but basically is what would be the average if not more in in most of our cases um because john you're you're mostly an analog guy right he, he's nodding yes um so the reason why i i wanted to have this conversation is because i notice that when i get buried in something digital i tend not to come up for air as much um, and it makes things a lot more difficult to actually create. I, yeah, there's a balance there. There's definitely a balance. I think in, in any of your playing, there's a balance. When we're, when we're chasing tone versus when we're, when we're trying to get the thing done. But I will say this. So, so one of the things I think that, that um, not everybody uh, is behind on, but I know that, that as, a, as an analog man walking into the digital world, I think the one thing that scares me the most is MIDI. And um, that's the least I, scary thing there is. I don't mean to say that it scares me as in it, I'm frightened of it. It scares me in that I'm afraid because I'm a coder, you know, from yeah. back. And, and I'm afraid I'll get, I'll just deep dive into it. And I, I don't know if that's something that I really need to deep dive into that much. I, I know that I'm going to have to deep dive into it once the cable comes in for my, um, uh, amp one and you so know what control that i jim just just speaking personally i don't know that with what you're going to be doing that you're going to be using midi that deeply um if you're just looking to change patches on two devices or like things like that it should be fairly trivial um 
it's not like what they're going to do in the next Helix update where you're going to be able to actually trigger mini notes and yeah. stuff. They're, yeah. they're basically configuring it so that you can send pretty much any mini message you want from any button or controller yeah. that's hooked up to the Helix. Yeah. You could basically play the Helix like, like floor pedals for an organ. Okay. Yep. That's what I was just going to say. From what I could see, you'll be able to, if you have a MIDI controllable keyboard, um, then you'll or be any, able to... any tone generator. I mean, it doesn't right. have to be, right. you know, it can be anything that generates a tone. So. That's true. You could, do, you could put it into MIDI into your computer. Or just, yeah, or even just a little module because they, cause they yeah. make little MIDI modules. Yeah, they do. For, yeah. Um, for uh, keyboard players to expand their sound palettes and stuff. Yeah. Uh, or sequencers or i mean it just it, it gets endless now because they, basically the, the helix itself becomes an instrument unto itself i'll be well, a it, limited one but an instrument unless but as we as we move into the digital age it was interesting because i was watching glenn fricker today and he um mentioned how uh he had gone to this um this show that was all like punk and heavy metal because he's a heavy metal guy and there punk weren't real amps on stage no amps yeah. All Axe Effects yep. Kempers. Yep. Everything. Helix, Axe Effects, Kempers. That was it. <clears throat> when I went to that metal show with uh, Dan, uh, there was a, I don't remember which band it is. Maybe you can, maybe you can fill us in. But uh, one of the bands had a Tiny Terror on stage. And that was like, that was like the funniest thing in the world to me, to be in a room with like Cannibal Corpse's monster, like 412s. A, a, a wall of four twelves, which they were all on, and then there's like a micro terror and a and a it wasn't a micro terror, it was a it was a tiny terror uh, base okay. head, and then like like a like a I don't even think it was a four by ten cabinet, but it was like it was like the tens of the cab, you know. <laughs> and I just I just sat there and shook my head like what, is this for real? So yeah, but when you think. I don't remember who they were, but it was definitely the second band. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was kind of ridiculous looking. <laughs> well, it's not it's not a question of being ridiculous looking. Like I could I noticed that the bass wasn't as present in that band's sound. Now, I but that is definitely front of house's fault. Because let's be honest, if your front of house engineer is worth a damn, they know that like a small amp like that needs to be pushed up in the mix and everything else needs to be brought back. Um, and there was no way that a one four by twelve in a room with that many bodies was gonna was gonna be absorbed that heavily. I think they just pushed the guitar up in the mix and just didn't worry about it. So, how many of you guys have seen facades put up to make it look like you've got? Uh, Nick Bonner says that. I I have been to so I went to a Journey cover band, uh, and they had like the quote unquote wall of marshals. And it wasn't even, they didn't even make a, a good attempt on purpose. It was like, it was like, it was like a curtain. Yeah, it was a curtain. And I, I also went to, and it was a curtain at Marshall's. Yeah. <laughs> and, yep. and I got whatever. Extra points uh, if they come out through the curtain. Yeah. ACDC, uh, um, an ACDC cover band that did that. Um, and I've seen it with um, someone. Uh, oh, it was, um, it was a little river band. That that I went to see them and it was a facade. I went, you know, and met the guys and talked to them and stuff. Oh, and and America, which I don't even know why they would do a facade, but it was more for a look. Um, yeah, they yeah. Had on stage. <laughs> so, they, yeah, go ahead. I I have seen various bands do this. Some of them are bands that would probably surprise people. Um. I have heard Guns N' Roses was doing it on their on their last tour. Um, that they they had some I forget what amps they had they had out front the because they were obviously Marshalls, but behind that there was like some other amp, you know, on a on a oh was, I think it was a Mesa Boogie or something like some something weird like that that you wouldn't you wouldn't associate with with Slash or, or Guns or anything like that, and it was just sitting off to the side like on a cab somewhere because. Well, they don't even try to hide it. Cause if you got backstage passes, like the, the reality is you're, you, you saying what you saw is not going to get out in the open. And in some cases the, the, the amps aren't even right behind the stuff anymore. They're under this. The yeah. This harkens back to, um, there were a lot of contract things. So when you get a, when you get a contract and you sign a contract that says, I'm a signature artist, there you get a deal, levels, right? Levels of signature artists, some signature artists, all it does is give them a price break. Up, but, yeah, and and that's so, usually what most people have, but right. 
But some signature artists, take a John Mayer or a, um, something like that, they're required to have a certain amount of time. There are hours that they're supposed to have it on stage and they're supposed to have it, you know, in, in certain, um, uh, you'll, you'll post 5,000 Instagrams this year with a picture of PRS, you know, whatever. I'm, not, I'm just making stuff up on top of my head. And so um, they were required to do that. And uh, so I'd seen um, in the 80s, I'd seen people who were playing guitars that looked like Fenders that weren't Fenders. And I saw a lot of people doing stuff like that. And um, I wouldn't be surprised uh, to, to hear some of the, the real um, crux of fake Gibsons are because artists want something made that's not a Gibson, but they're, you know, their signature Gibson artists and so on. So, so anyway, going back, um, Cheap Trick, when I saw them long, long time ago. They had the fakes. They had fakes. And what was funny was um, that, uh, what's the, Rick Nielsen had a little guitar amp that wasn't much bigger than this. It was back in the lunchbox. He had thing, a tiny right? terror. He had a tiny terror. And he yeah. had it inside of a cabinet that had yep. been gutted. <laughs> that is a fa- there's a famous photograph that floats yes. around forums of yeah. that tiny terror and no and people still dispute it yeah. they're like there's no way real. yeah they, no dude they doubled it and they were doing all sorts of other stuff at the board to make it sound huge but yep. he was just running a tiny terror because it was the easiest way for them to get the sound they wanted yep and even like so slash playing a, a, a mesa it I'm not saying that that's exactly what what was reported, but I but I'm that sounds accurate to me. Like people would people would be like that. There's no way. There's no way. It, to be completely honest, like there's absolutely a way because they, these guys, if you're at that level and you're playing a gig at, at a stadium and you want to make sure you're getting the sound the way you want it, you don't care who's endorsing you. It's yep. just making sure that it's consistent and it works and it does what it's supposed to do. It sounds the way you want it to. Now, like, it, um, looking back way back in the old acoustic days, back in the days when acoustic guitars were played by musicians, um, they, uh, there was this guy who um, his last name was Bookbender. Like a book. That yeah, was yeah, yeah. Bookbender. Um, I'd have to look him up. He's a, he was a um, blues guy um you know uh, along the lines of jim croce and that style of music and he um was endorsed at one time by this company but they screwed him over in the endorsement so what he did was he took black tape and he just taped it over the name of the yeah the the guitar company he was like fuck you (laughs) you're not gonna pay me the you know or whatever it was that they screwed him over on i'm not gonna endorse you anymore but I still like the guitars. Well, I think it's funny because like people, I, I've seen people who get bent out of shape on signature models. Like, oh, my favorite player is playing this. I want to buy it. And I'm like, why? Yeah. Well, why? Do you sound like them? Right. Hey, three quarter of the time, the person is telling you this sounds nothing like them. Right, right. <laughs> oh, you, you'd see it in the vocal community too. So yeah. People, oh man, so-and-so is using a, you know, an SM58 beta, so I've got to use a beta. Why? What are you going to get out of the beta? What is it you think? No, gonna- use what you're comfortable with. Like, if you're, I'm not saying that I could take Jack White's airline guitars and, and make them sound like me, but I'm also saying that, like, I wouldn't do that because it's not my style. But at the same time, like, Jack I White could play that style of music on, you know, that Ibanez Destroyer we were talking about earlier. Right. I could play that style of music right on there and nobody would know. Yeah, I could play it on an SG. Um, and I'd rather play it on an SG than on his friggin' um, uh, guitar, that silver tone. You could take that, stick that where the sun doesn't shine. Yeah. <laughs> you know my feelings on the silver tones. And I own one, people, so shut oh, I up. Thought he, I thought he, had, I thought he was playing an airline. Cool. I thought it was an airline. They're, they're all the same company. It's yeah. all Valco, but it's Valco. Yeah. It's the same thing. crap. They're all oh. junk. They and came out of Chicago, so they must be terrible. Yeah. yeah woo. Since I am from <laughs> Chicago, I can say this oh. and not care. <laughs> Remember con instruments. They're from Chicago too. Con. Yeah. Um, so I've done that many in many a guitar store here. <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah. Are they still around up there? Uh, I see old ones every once in a while. Yeah. So, so I, I, uh, everybody, I played, um, a golden 
LG this week at Guitar Center. Um, I stopped it. I had to get headphones for work. Um, and man, that thing was sweet. Uh, it was, but the funny part about it was, it's, it's ten years old. It had been played every day, and whoever had it, that was their main gig in guitar because it was beat up. And dude, I almost bought it. It was only like five hundred bucks. Oh, I was but, gonna um, say. Oh. What was funny about it was that the strings on it, I swear, were the original strings that came out of the out of the box of that guitar. They were covered in rust. It was like I, like to the point where I I wanted to like play it some more, but I'm like, dude, I'm gonna have to use hand sanitizer. Like this is bad. Or get a tetanus shot. <laughs> you know, it was, it was I, bad. I don't know how people do that. I so I have a um my uh. CE needs strings now just because I don't like the way the E string isn't holding tune quite where I want it to. And the B string is starting to lose some of its tone. So I'm like, they're going off. I don't know how people do it. I don't know how they, they make strings last that long. I can't do it. Um, I don't know. I think back to the Vernon Reed conversation. Yep. Um, I, I, that brought up a lot of things to me for, um for convenience reasons like i was thinking about like why guitarists are making this shift towards simplicity and and for the sake of you know just being able to set up quickly and all that Mm -hmm. and you were talking about punk bands like glenn fricker going to that show where there was literally nothing on stage and i just kind of like scratched my head a little bit and i'm like you know have we really gotten to the point where we've lost sight of the music for the sake of convenience? Well, I, I, all right. So I'm going to say this. The, the fact is that when you're doing shows, um, the, the money comes from entertaining people. We've had this discussion before, and I don't want to go down the, the horrible rabbit hole that we went to. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to say this. There, at some point, you're trying to pay the bills. And it's and at some point that is the only thing that pays your bills. So when you go to work, you want to wear your journey t-shirt, but you've got to wear, you know, a, a suit and tie. But yeah, yeah, but, but when the, you're talking about genres like that, the attitude I, is more important than I'm getting there. Yeah. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So now Punk went from being punk, real punk, right? When I grew up punk, when punks were stabbing each other literally and, and uh, there was, you know, there was death and there was heroin and it was... You mean black metal? Green Day. Yeah. <laughs> and then it became Green Day. And then it became, you know, the, the, um, you know, the Clash started it and kind of moved it into that, that uh, era of pop. And so now the, the concert goer has an expectation. And here's the problem. So the concert goers, the, the Kiss, Kiss concert right now is, or the tour is a prime example of it. Kiss knows that the, the, their audience has a, a certain level of, of expectation. And so they're not going to go out there without tracks. Everybody's got tracks. You'd be surprised at the bands that don't have tracks. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's so, a common place thing now. So an Axe Effects, a Helix, and a, and a Kemper, any one of those things, or all of them actually, can be triggered using MIDI. Now I can go out without a tech. I can have one person controlling all my effects at the same time um, because the machine is, is going to the thing. I've got a click in my ear. I know when the song's going to start. I know when it's going to stop. I know when it's going to Whether I'm bowling for soup or I'm Green Day or I'm um, Avenged Sevenfold, there are certain things that are going to happen, right? There's, there's going to be a one, two, three, pow. This grenade's going to go off over here. It's going to, I'll tell you a, a, a true story. So when I was young, I was in a band, we were doing a song called Burning For You by Blue Oyster Cult, right? And our sound man had a little button. One said left and one said right, okay? This is a true story. So I would go over to one side of the stage and say, I'm burning, I'm burning, I'm burning for you. And then the flash pot on the opposite side of the stage was supposed to go off. I knew so I he'd trigger it, trigger it. left and I went to my right, my left, my right. They connected his left to left, which my, now my left. So in other words, they went stage left instead of his left. So he punched the wrong one first. That flash plot went off right in my face. And it, and it, um, it went, you know, and, and yeah, I lost a little, you know, facial hair and some 
eyebrows for a bit. And it looked like I had a sunburn. It wasn't that bad, but I was blinded. And I was walking around the stage, couldn't find myself, couldn't find my marker. I was the step, the you know, the edge of the stage. It was a it was a nightmare. So I'm just getting to to this. It's now these things are, are there's whole productions, and even if you're punk, you have productions. There's lights that are going off. There's everything else that's going off. I mean, you can imagine that Pink Floyd was probably one of the first people that went, "Woo, MIDI, yay! We don't need 45 guys on the lights. We only need one person clicking it off." And you know, the whole the whole thing has come to where um, your whole stage show is controlled by a single computer, by a person sitting in the middle of the of the thing anymore, and. The, I know that the guys that are guitar techs are probably holding on to their for dear lives to the fact, that, oh, please keep keep using you know gear that, that needs me because if you don't, you I'm gonna be ass out. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start and then I'm gonna I'm gonna hand off to uh, to our audience for this, but yeah, um, I I agree to a point. There is definitely an area of music that exists right now which is where the money is at, where, where people that are, you know, wanting to make money are at. But that's not all that's out there. And so I would be remiss to say that if Glenn Fricker says he went to a punk metal show, I'm willing to bet it was not that at all. Not that kind of production. But it has gotten to the point where people are so familiar with that style of technology that's so pervasive that they, they've forgotten how the old guys used to do it. Um, and so it has now become convenience as champion for them only because they don't know any better, right? We talked about this on the, on the last episode, how digital people have kind of like grown up with this era of digital guitar. And so for them, it's not necessarily as big a deal um, to go back to analog. And in some cases, they may not even prefer it. Like they may go back and, and say, nah, I, I'm just fine with my pod or whatever I'm using um, right. to get the sounds that I need. Um, but like, with some forms of music, and I, and, and I, I want to be very specific about, about this, with some forms of music, attitude is actually more important to entertainment for the audience than what's going on on stage. And I, I know it sounds insane, but these are the situations like with guys like Devin Townsend, right? So Devin Townsend is, if you don't know who he is, he is a very, very popular guitar player who does basically nothing on stage. Like he set up his guitar with these tunings where he literally just like hammers things on and it's, and so he can sing, he can focus on his singing, which is very, it's a whole other experience. Now he does have the stage show to go along with it, but he also understands that like you can watch, you can watch clinics with him. And he talks about the fact that, yeah, I can do all these things, you know, and, and I can do them in the studio. But when I come out live, I don't have to do I don't have to do any of that. But he makes fun of himself because he doesn't do it because he realizes like the people that he's interested in and he grew up listening to weren't doing that. And I, it's almost like he feels like I, I got the impression after watching a clinic with him today. I got the impression that he was almost saying, um, yeah, people are paying money to see me. And I'm not really sure why other than I like my music, like you like my music, which is great. but it was almost like, I'm not that good a musician. Like I really wish, you know, I would be rewarded for something that's great. I, I was just the attitude I got from him. Um, if you go back to some of the other bands like Henry Rollins and all that stuff, the real punk music, those guys didn't give a crap what, what their guitar sounded like. They didn't give a crap how loud they were. Um, they could have cared less about whether you liked their, their lyrics like it was just, it wasn't that important to them. And that is the, the, that is like the complete opposite attitude of the music today where people are getting away with no cabs on stage, none of the other stuff. Um, and I, I've certainly felt this attitude from other guitar players. Like I'll go to the store and I know some people who are in some, some reasonably, you know, well-to-do bands locally who are like, yeah, I, I won't do anything that doesn't blow my pant legs. Like if I don't have actual air coming out of a cabinet, it's just, it's a waste of time. Those are not the people that are playing yacht rock or anything like that. They're, these guys are hard rockers, heavy metal people. And that's, that's like a whole other thing. Cause for them, it's about authenticity. Um, which is why Dan, you and I were just talking about the, um, 
the guy with the, the tiny terror base head or whatever, the base terror or whatever it was like, there is still people out there doing it for real. And you just got to seek them out. That's, that's basically what it is. So what do you guys think? Like, I, that's why I wanted to get you guys involved in this. You guys go see local music occasionally um, and have been involved in the scenes that you're involved in for a long time. Like, what are your thoughts on this? For me, I mean, that it really, I'm not a huge, you know, disapprover of using digital pedals and not having an amp on stage. It all depends if it sounds good to you and to the audience. Does it really matter? Yeah. Uh, well, so in response to, to what you've said, I feel like it doesn't as much, but I think there are logistical reasons why you would go one way or the other. And those have to do with like, what we saw, the sound guy determines whether you sound good or not. And the more control you give the sound guy, the harder it is for you to sound proper. And so I think like I, I, the prevailing thought on that is your sound guy, if you, t- if you give him a helix signal, right? Like I give him a feed out from some or an Axe effects or whatever, Kemper, um, I get to control all the variables before it hits the sound, sound guy's hands, right? But I don't think that really means a whole lot because the sound guy can still screw it up really bad. All he has to do is drop the bass, cut the mids, and you're done. You know, um, and I've been to shows where it's pretty clear, like the guitar player had his his act together, and it gets the sound guy, and the sound guy's like just doesn't care. Maybe he's drunk, whatever. Who who knows? Um, and it, it, it just takes all the teeth out of it. I feel like at least when I go to a gig and if I'm going to play and I have a cab. Like if the sound guy's screwing me, I'll just turn it up. Like I will, I will drown out their PA. Like if you have a hundred watt head, you can get away with that. I obviously don't have a hundred watt head anymore, but like that's kind of been the thought in the back of my mind about these high head room amps that are available now. Um, like the hundred watt heads and boss has that new tube, uh, the tube amp commander or whatever it's called. It has a hundred watt. It's hundred Watts inside the thing. And then you run a, it's, it runs as a load box. So you put it in it's silence and then you can use their, Uh, amplification to drive your cabs um that's a really cool tool for that sort of thing however i mean nobody wants to wants to you know give the sound guy the finger i mean i i I think that's but but i've been in those situations where it's like it would be nice if i could override them if i had to so anyway any, any other thoughts john yeah i tend to uh my wife and i and uh and some of our friends tend to go to some not so local places. Uh, one in particular, Daryl's house up in uh, Pauling, New York. Okay. And I'll tell you, uh, we've seen a lot of different acts there, a lot of different styles of music. Um, and the sound is so consistent. And, you know, it's, 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 never, it's never a bad night there. I'll tell you, it's, it's really good. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the house sound. You know, um, the guy that's running it. Um, the entertainment that's there, you know, it, once in a while, you know, you'll see somebody, you know, do one of these or whatever, but yeah, it's such a small environment and such an intimate place that it's always good. You know, it's always good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we try, there's a couple of venues around here that are like that, but I remember, um, probably what, 10 years ago I was reading an article and they were talking about how bad Chicago's music venues are for, for acoustics and, and, uh, sound equipment and that kind of thing. Like, none of our venues are very highly thought of they're all pretty universally pretty bad apparently now we've got a couple of newer ones that have opened up i don't know if they're any better but that's really kind of kind of telling when you're in a metropolitan area and people don't like the sound you know <laughs> i'm trying to re- i'm trying to remember the name of one of them that i i went to when i was on a business trip there a couple of years ago was it like the rim or something like it that? was a, it was a blues club and i want to say it was kingston mines uh rings a bell but i don't i wouldn't know where that's at yeah i'll I'll just see if i can find it and uh and send you something on it but i'll tell you it was it was quite interesting there were two stages in the place and someone was always playing on one stage and when they were done everybody got up walked into the other room yeah and listened to the next guy it was it was a cool place but you you kind of you had to kind of wonder when you went up to the front of the place there was a ticket place with a little hole about this big outside. Uh-huh. And I mean, we had never been in there, but people were like, go, 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 go check it out. And that was, that was raw sound. I mean, it was, it was fun. It was really cool. If you get the chance to check it out, you might want to check it out. 
So I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, if they're still around, I'm, I'll maybe have to head up there sometime. I think um, for the purposes of this discussion, though, I, I think it's just really just, um, I think it's just a control issue really for me. Like more than anything else, it's the fact that I expect the audience at least, if at least I can get the audience in the first like three rows of people to hear what I'm supposed to sound like, like I feel better about it. But I could, I mean, running into a venue where you're going Helix and you don't hire your own sound guy and you don't, and it's, or, and, or it's not somebody you trust. It, like that's sketchy for me. I, those venues you're talking about, like, like Daryl's house, like we know who's behind that. And, uh, that's, I mean, that is a, uh, that's going to be world-class sound. It, it is because, because we know who that is. So, um, anyway, Jim, Get well, a <clears throat> all right so daryl's house and and that aside because daryl's house is a completely different thing daryl grew up in the philly scene he's a musician he if let me put it to you this way and john um i'm sure you're you, the smile on your face is is proving everything i'm about to say is that if somebody walked away and said wow the, the sound sucked at daryl's house Daryl himself would make sure the sound yeah. never sucked again at Daryl's house. Yeah, yeah. He'd be like, who, who said that? I want to interview him. Like, his name, focus group time. <laughs> yeah, his name is literally on the house. And anybody who doesn't know, he actually lives in that area there. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think the house, Daryl's house, the, the club, right? It's, um, John, correct me if I'm wrong. It's like, it's like a building separate from his actual home, right? It's, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. At one point in time, you know, he did those shows that were, you know, on, on television or whatever. And it was in his house. Yeah. And then they basically took what it looked like in his house and then built a restaurant a club, and yeah. basically put a restaurant around what his house used to look like. Yeah. Which Hopefully is why I, cool like that here. When I go to, when I go to go to Daryl's house, um, uh, next year, I'm going to, ha- I'm going to ask John if I can um, plop in his house. But anyway, so. <laughs> sure thing. Nice. So, and then we're going nice. to, then we're going to go over to the PRS store and go have some fun. There you go. <laughs> nice. That's why I wait until next year. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to bring me some cash. So, um, <laughs> all right. So the thing that I, yeah, I'm you're going to need it. <laughs> I want to talk about it this way because we know that the Helix and the oh yeah because I will need it I will be spending money but the um, the Helix the HX effects and, and the Axe effects and this stuff it's all we know that there's there's a, a primary mover um, in worship right in that they need a quiet stage and they do all this stuff and you yeah. and do not want that rocking punking thing but you still yeah. want really good sound you want it to be um, you know heard the fact is that if if I'm a if I'm a three piece or five piece that that's your typical size of your rock band yeah right 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 three to five if I'm in a three piece band I want to met and I, and we're not playing big places right if I'm uh, Angel right now or uh, the guys in the Stars they're yeah like less than a thousand seat kind of you gotta, yeah you're you're a thousand or less you've got to you've got to maximize the amount of money you can bring in against the you know your costs right well, and you're so, talking about you were talking about tax earlier is that where you're going with this well so, no not, not so much as tax but um you you have to get on a train and go oh yeah sure no transport costs and you're gonna, cartage you're gonna go, yeah and you're not you're not big enough to get a, a plane yourself you probably want sure. to first class everything's going to sit under the plane it's going to fly out sure and, th- and those are the and those are the really good valid reasons to have that and I, I, I've argued like all along, everybody should have both. You should have a good, decent amp. But if you do get that t- style of gig, or if you're going to go play a show where you're not going to have the luxury of being able to use that, you need something else like a backup system of some sort, be it a digital effects thing or, or you know, an amp one or something that you can get like just a direct out from. Um, yeah, and you guys have seen the picture of my pedal board. So if you look at my pedal board, that's everything. That's the hundred watt amp. That's the effects units. That's the power supply. That's the whole nine yards, and it is small enough that I can fit it into the overhead compartment, and I can fly it. So, good luck. <laughs> not, I'm just saying I can. I'm not saying that the, that I will be able to. I I will put my regular uh, my underwear and everything under there before I put that stuff under. Well, I would, the reason why I was the reason why I was saying that is because those, you know, they say, oh well, fit in an overhead compartment the the um, pedal board. 
I have yet to see a pedal train like with, with two rows that will fit in an overhead compartment. I've yet to see one. Um, I'm flying in, uh, I'm flying in April to, uh, to Texas. And I'm like, I'm already like thinking about like what I need to pack and like how small it needs to be. And <laughs> cause I'm taking camera equipment. That's yeah. that's the the concern. I'm like, am I going to be able to fit this in the overhead? And you think about like a camera is not much. You should be able to fit that in a regular suitcase. And I'm still concerned about whether it's going to fit in the overhead. Well, the suitcase that I've stuck this inside of, let me just put it to this way, is a suitcase I've flown to Texas. I've flown, oh, okay. to, California, I've right. flown to Washington State. I've flown everywhere. And that that board fits inside that small suitcase. And you that hope they don't make a gate check. That over sucks. saw overstuffed many times and stuffed up into the yeah. thing under the under the seat in front of me. And yes, were my feet like this? Yeah. You know, the whole time I had no foot room and I was like, Eep! you know, and, and uh, luckily I was a little thinner back then. But um I'm not I, I'm know. not as concerned about checking a guitar as people think I am either. And I'm like, not really that concerned about checking the pedal board. I put it into yeah, a, a hard case. By I know a lot of people. A lot of people check TSA case pedal boards all the time. So yeah, pedal board's not as big a deal as your guitar. But even then, like I think if you pack your guitar properly and have a decent quality case to begin with, yeah. And here's a here's a here's a pro tip. I've heard this from many people. The reason guitars survive in gig bags is because they're not heavy. Right. People don't, they, the TSA guys break them because they throw them. They yep. get mad that they have to pick up this heavy ass case and then they throw it onto the conveyor. Yep. If you don't want that to happen, get a light case. Yeah. Rhett, <laughs> Schull, Rhett Schull uses the uh, mono. Is it mono? Yeah. I know a lot of people who fly with mono, mono, yep. mono bags and they, they claim that they are roadworthy for flying on airplanes. Yep. That's what and they, they were for. And they actually check. Yeah. The yeah, he yeah, he checks his yes. mono back. And he said that uh, Peter Strauss checks every flight on a, with a mono case. That's amazing. I'm yeah, really it's un- literally unbelievable to me as well. But then again, somebody like Nita Strauss isn't flying with a 59 Les Paul either. No. Yeah. And putting <laughs> you it in, know. in his seat next to them with the seatbelt on. And oh, yeah, have, you seen, have you seen Bonamassa's Instagram where he puts the 59 in the seat next to him and straps it in like a baby? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, okay, so that guitar costs more than than every seat in the whole thing. He's worth these. Yeah, worth it deserves it. its own seat. He's uh, had them try know. to make him check it, even though he's bought a t- bought a seat ticket for it. Yeah, they're like they're like no, when this flight is oversold, sir, that needs to be for a person. And he's yeah. like, no, uh, uh-uh. uh, <laughs> he's like that's a hundred fifty thousand dollar guitar. Like you're out of your mind. <laughs> so, um, and I I know he's missed flights over it before too. Yeah, which which makes it even crazier. But that flying V of his, he he did, um, he did that. He bought a seat for it. There's that. Yeah. Whole, that's a really cool little story about him buying. Yeah. V oh, the Amos is it Amos? Yeah. 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 Amos. yeah. So, um, I don't think any of us are like that crazy, where we have a guitar that's like so super rare and irreplaceable that we wouldn't travel with it. And the other thing is, like, you hear these horror stories, um guy puts a forklift through, you know, 57 Strat or something. And then the guy's like, oh, my God, my priceless 57 Strat is gone. And then he goes and gets his $15,000 check from Clarion Insurance to go buy another. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, yes, every guitar is special. Like, I, I totally get having a personal intimate relationship with guitars. I have several that I'm, I feel like I'm very close to. And if something happened to him, I wouldn't know what I would do. But let me give you a tip. Don't fly with that guitar if you're going to check it. Like, it's, it's not hard. Like, pick another one. Yeah, that's why I have this SE right here. Yeah. yeah I, wonder um, about, I wonder about insurance when it comes to that kind of stuff. If, you know... Uh, your homeowners ain't going to cover it. Right. You know, but if you have, a, like, an umbrella policy or an extra policy... Right. Maybe. I mean, you're talking about flying here. It's different than it being in your home and having... Yeah, well, cl- well, like, Clarion, they cover it at a gig. They don't care. Yeah. Um, cause it, cause it, the, you're basically ensuring the fact that you have this instrument. Right. Um, it's not like dependent. I mean, you could, I could, I could, somebody could rear in my car and damage my instrument. I call up Clarion. Clarion says, what instrument was it? I give them the serial number. They go and get me a blue book value on it. And, and, and actually they will. So the way that Clarion works and I'm going to get, I got to get insurance through them. Um, I, I've been, I've been 
baiting them for like months. Like I'll, I'll put in the quote and then they'll come back and they'll talk to me. And then like, I never pull the trigger because I do have insurance on my homeowners and I'm not playing professionally right now. So it's covered. Um, and my, all of my stuff is new. I don't have anything vintage that I have to worry about. So if something broke, like I just get another one. Um, but Clarion will actually cover the, the value of a vintage instrument based on an appraisal. So when you get your policy, you have to have all your equipment appraised by a credible party which is usually like you take it to your local guitar shop and you ask them and then they they basically insure it for that value and if something happens you get whatever the guitar is worth i mean um and you can go back and you can adjust your you know i i my understanding is you can adjust your insurance uh as needed so like if a guitar for whatever reason let's say jack white plays this one stratocaster that i own and all of a sudden everybody's buying them and the value goes through the roof all i do is call them up and say i gotta read i gotta you know redo my policy and uh, tell them, you know, there's my guitar and like show them the serial number and they'll, they'll up the value. So right. it's not right. expensive either. It, that, that's what gets me. I have, I have the value of a, of a midsize car in equipment and my insurance rate was going to be like 11 bucks a month or something. Mm-hmm. It's nothing. It's for peace of mind. It's nothing. So it's totally now, worth it. Yeah. So so going to what we were talking about, the, the bands, um, you know, the, the tour, some of them have the money and some of them don't to be able to do that. And some of them rent the gear or get it loaned to them when they get into towns that are far away. Um, I know that uh, when the stars were touring, you know, in the years prior, they were doing it out west. So most of the band had to get into planes and fly out west to, and play. So, yeah, Rich is going to put Strat under there or whatever and, and get that out west. but. Um, you know, how much gear are you going to truck out there? You know, it's really expensive to, to ship that stuff. And can you get gear rented to you long enough? And can it, can it pay for itself while you have it out long enough to do that tour? You know what I'm talking about? Because even if you're only doing three or four months, it's, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. And you're not getting your regular income. These guys are, you know... Um, some of these people, they, they have real jobs. Remember the, um, the story on, what was that band, uh, Anvil? Yeah. The, the guys, uh, the, you know, they were, the one guy's delivering food to, uh, to ele- elementary schools. Yeah. And Do whatever he can. Yeah. Uh, who was it that I was listening to the other day they were doing an interview and they talked about Anvil, like being influential in their guitar playing when they were growing up. Really? Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I was really into that band. (laughs) And he's like, when the story of Anvil happened, he's like, I was like, just flabbergasted because he couldn't, he couldn't anticipate that somebody he'd looked up to like that was in the situation they were in. So, um, I don't know. I kind of want to approach this because you were talking about texts and at least it came up in conversation. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it specifically, but I do want to talk about the technician relationship thing that's been happening for like the last 12 to 13 years. So touring musicians, um, typically you'll hire a technician to oversee your instruments and rig. Um, hey, Jim, I, I don't know that things like the Helix have really done away with the, the technician aspect of it because I see what a lot of bands are doing now is like they have one technician for everybody. Right. Um, but I would say that like a lot of bands, smaller bands or bands that aren't necessarily, you know, super platinum, every album kind of deal. Um, will hire like a friend to do their tech work and they're just on the payroll. They're not making a ton of money. Like that's okay. Um, I, I, it's a sucky state of affairs though, that like we, um, we're to the point where we're like, well, we really don't need to maintain our instruments on the road. Um, well, okay. So <laughs> yeah, and more and more musicians are doing it themselves. I mean, I, I mentioned yeah. show earlier, um, he takes his, care of his guitar and I'm not sure. Cause he's, he's, um, He's touring with a guy, Josh Guthrie or something. And, and um, uh, Josh takes care, I think, of his own gear. So, um, and I was, um, I've been following um, RJ Rangilio. And RJ was talking about the fact that um, he toured with uh, a band, their, their guitar player. It was a famous band. I can't remember. It was a metal band. So, um, but the guitar player got hurt and he stepped in and, you know, finished the tour with them so they could, they could complete it. And uh, it was just funny because he was talking about, wow, I had a tech. And he toured the world with several different punk bands yeah. and everything else. Never had a tech. So it's, it's just something that, you know, at some point you got to learn to do yourself. 
when we were talking about Ola England the other day in conversation, you're not familiar with Ola, Jim, but for anybody in the group that doesn't know, I mean, I know Dan knows who Ola is. Um, he plays with uh, The Haunted and he has his own project called Feared and he has, he's working on a solo album. And uh, he's also, you know, he's a big YouTube guitar personality. Right. Um, and he's deeply in the metal scene, obviously. But what's, what's really funny is he talks about like how he tours. They go on tour sometimes you know they'll go to japan or whatever he takes three guitars he has three guitars they're they're all ever tuned he literally just sets them up puts them in the thing goes and and it's to the point where like the ever tune is so good that nothing is ever unstable on the guitars he just pulls them out of the case doesn't even tune them up goes around on stage plays them puts them right back in the case at the end of the night and he's ready to rock and roll the next day that's that's why that ever tune technology exists why that bridge exists it's because yeah. people don't want to pay technicians. We have a user or, or a, um, a group, uh, I don't know if you call them, uh, fan? I don't know. Anyway, one of the guys, uh, uh, James Shearer, he uses uh, the Evertune on one of his guitars. That, and he swears by it himself. He says, yeah, that thing is always in tune. Yeah, well, now we get to the point where we're, we're getting to the point where some of these companies are making the necks insanely stable. Um, it was a Vigier, I think, is one of the guitars that doesn't even have a truss rod anymore. It has carbon fiber graphite rods mm -hmm. in the in the neck. Uh, Kiesel does carbon fiber, and their truss rods are like double reinforced. Um, other companies are doing similar things because there. I think for the professional musician, like stability has become a really important factor because you don't have a tech anymore. Yeah. I don't look. Do we need techs as guitar players? Like, I'm not even sure that that there really should be a thing. But I, 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 it's not important to me. Like, the, I, I, it sucks that these people that have found employment doing that over the years are now like kind of not not able to get work or whatever. But I'm not going to sit here and pretend like rock and roll depends on a tech, like a technician to be backstage tuning up your guitars. That's okay, so for the for the average, and I would say even the above most of the above average players, no. But if you're ZZ Top and you've got 18 guitars that come out on that stage all night long, yeah, but. But that's the level of show where they do need a guitar. To, you know what I mean? Like, right, that's what so I'm there's, there's definitely a definable level where things get crazy and you got to have guys to sort out your Bradshaw rig, you know? Um, and I, I think, honestly, the rise of the tech being so important in rock music really happened because of things like the Bradshaw rigs, where Steve Vai could not tell you what, what was going on for the programming for his Bradshaw when he's on the road. Like, he's not going to... He, he might be the one guy who probably could. His but, tech has a daily job. It's not just when yeah. he's on the road. That tech. He works as a recording engineer and everything every else for him. Every single yeah. day, right. Yeah, but I'm, but I'm just saying like that level of rig, like that size. Uh, Mark Tremonti would be a classic example, right? When he had his, when he had his Bradshaw rig, because I don't think he's even using that anymore. He's a pedal to the amp guy now. But I think Vernon Reed. Vernon Reed yeah. is a, a perfect example. If he had to set that thing up every night right. and make sure everything was working, like that guy would be making like ten bucks an hour. <laughs> I mean, it would just be nuts. I can tell you right now that the guy, the um, I can't remember who it was was talking about this the other day. I want to say it was Tim Pierce. Um, it might have been uh, Ray Parker Jr. But anyway, they were talking about tech thing, and they were saying that, and I know because I've been this person. You go in, you do load in, you do setup, you do sound check, you do all this stuff, and you're exhausted. Yeah. And then you have to play. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was Ray Parker Jr. who said, once I got a tech, he said, Dad, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> well, that's, I, I, look at, I look at the whole thing and I go, you know, in my, I will never have a tech. Even if I did somehow like land a thing where I was touring, you know, every couple months and work would allow me to do it, et cetera. Like I would never, I, I, I couldn't imagine having a tech. Like it just, it's never going to happen for me. Um, at the same time, like if that were to happen to me where I was doing, you know, I was fly, doing fly dates, I'd have to get, I'd have to get an Evertune guitar, which means no tremolo, right, but I'm not, that's all you could do. I mean. Right, but I'm not, uh, I, I would say the same thing, but I'm not um, CZ Top, but I don't have eight tube heads and. 18 guitars or um uh brad paisley you know i mean I'm, i i my whole thing is i'm just super picky like if there's any sort of like weird fret rattle going on or whatever 
I'm taking them to the shop to get them worked on or I'm working on it myself. Cause, cause I, I just literally, um, over the last couple of weekends, cause it's been brutally, uh, really cold here. And now it's, and now it's starting to warm up. Um, I've got my hygrometer right here. I'm at 55% humidity right now. I got a pot of water boiling on the stove, but I, I dropped down to like 29 and my guitars all went out of whack. And I was literally sitting there with a truss rod because, because I can tell that, I mean, I can honestly tell you if my guitar is humidified or not based on playability almost immediately because I can feel it. I, I know what they feel like and I, I can tell by the bending almost immediately whether it, it's, it, it needs to be worked on. So for me to go out on stage, I don't, I never wanted to be the guy that was a John Patricia. She's like, my neck has to be dead flat. And if it's not, I'm going to be pissed kind of guy. Cause there's a, there's a rig rundown where he actually did that. He was that his uh, tech was talking about how like, they have to be dead flat. He's very critical of that. Um, I I never thought I would be that guy, but I kind of am. Like I've noticed, I can. I mean, it, it's make or break to the point where I'm like, this just this is just annoying me, and I'll I'll put it put it back on the wall and get another guitar. <laughs> um, I did that today. Worst time worst time of the year for it too, by the way. So that's probably why this is coming out right now. Yeah, yeah. I, um, so it was humid here today. So um, it was in the mid seventies and it was humid, and I had my windows open, so it's humid inside. Yeah, so it's yeah. one of those things you have to deal with um, humidity. All right, let me ask a question of the group. I'm going to ask you guys the, the question of the day. Let's do some round robin. Yeah, uh, there has been. I have heard so much in the last year about how the Telecaster is the perfect guitar. So I'm going to ask you guys. Not if the Telecaster is a perfect guitar. What, for you, is the perfect guitar? What's the perfect guitar? The one that's in my hand. <laughs> I like that answer. Whichever one I'm playing. The one that's working at that moment. The one that's working at yeah. that moment. Yeah. yeah. I'm not that picky. I, you know, I have, I have a few different ones. Um, and uh yeah i'm not i'm really not that picky i mean i think if i was in it as much as you are jim or or david i you know i'd probably be more picky about it but you know i have, I have a variety of different ones and they all kind of they're all a little different but i like them all you know i'll try to put a funny spin on this when i get to me so but uh yeah. Yeah, do you have a do you have like a particular favorite or something that hits all the bases for you that you think is like really good yeah uh it's actually a strat with yeah, okay all right with a humbucker in the bridge right no, yep. nothing or anything no, nothing that crazy it's everything all right all right yeah you know what for a lot of people you're absolutely right um that's why guitars like the ibanez az are seen as like the modern like new like this is what's going to take over kind of guitar um and it and it's starting like the sir sir's been doing it for a while too um it's just starting to be like that's the norm if you're if you're like guthrie govon right and you're doing every technique known to man and you're like blazing new trails what are you playing it's a strat with a humbucker in the bridge um, yeah it doesn't even have to be a fender it's any like strat style yeah. guitar it's just, well, i uh, think this is what we're talking about is like the prototype prototypical archetype of a guitar so yeah like a strat because yeah. actually for our listeners dan is holding a strat right now from uh this is harmony right yep yeah yeah um so jim why don't you answer yours first i'll save mine for last because it's gonna be really funny i might easy. i mean mine is easy i love my ce24 i just even haven't played a, a i have not even played a prs i love as much as that sarah or that prs ce24 now that said i have considered putting brighter pickups in it um but as far as playability and Everything I, I just love that guitar. So, it's my answer is not going to be funny, but it's the it's the anecdote that I'm going to provide for it. Um, so I think the Strat is probably not. It, it's not the perfect guitar. Like I think actually probably the most versatile guitar is probably the perfect guitar. But for me, I would say just a Stratocaster with with the right pickups. They got to be fat single coils. I can't do the the thin ones like the, the typical ones. Um, but I, the anecdote I wanted to share is like, I didn't realize how much I was in love with strats for like a really long time. I, I was buying all kinds of other guitars, like looking for a good strat was basically what was happening. 
Um, and, and I still make mistakes buying Stratocasters. Um, I got that, the red legacy that the pickups are going to go to that guitar is really bright because of the maple neck. It's a finished maple neck and it's just, it, it, me, it needs, it needs darker pickups. It's going to, um, you get lots of fret rattle on maple necks, finished maple necks. I've noticed that. Um, and it has to, it also has to do with just like the quality of maple that's on it and stuff, how tight the grain is and all that. But, um, I was trying to back. Oh, so what, what ended up happening to me? I bought my Gibson SG. I've always wanted an SG. Um, a lot of my favorite players have them. You, if you're a long time listener to the show, you've heard me wax poetic about why I bought my SG and stuff. Um, I, I have found myself at a gig recently. Uh, well, it wasn't a gig. It was like we were sitting in with somebody. This is about a year ago. Um, and I was like, you know, just getting down really hard. And I went and go grab my Webby bar. And I looked down and I went, what the hell? Like, where is my, and I realized, Oh shit, this is the wrong guitar. And, and then I was like, later on, I was trying to roll back the, uh, I was trying to roll back the bass knob on my, my GNL. And I'm like, wait a minute, I have two tone controls. This is not that guitar. Like what is going on? I just had a moment. And I realized I was like, I'm totally out of my element with this thing. Even though I can play it. Like I got through the gig and nobody complained. In fact, I was, um, really kind of surprised that nobody complained. Um, and it just, everything worked out and I wasn't like, I was totally fine with it. And, uh, walking away from that experience and realizing that kind of, I'm, I'm a little bit on John Bott's side that I think it's the perfect guitar for the perfect setup, like depending on what you're trying to achieve, especially in the studio. But for me, like what I'm most comfortable with, what I look for and what I remember I have is my strat. Like I look down for the whammy bar and everything else. Um, so, yeah, so when you say Strat, are you talking about Stratocaster or are you talking about your Strata like? I would say, I would say, no, I don't give a shit what brand is on the headstock, number one. I don't oh. care if it says GNL, GNL or if it says it's a fart factory, provided it has the right pickups in it. Like, I'll be happy with it. Um, it I've been looking at the fart factory this week. Let me see. Uh, uh, ZVEX? <laughs> I think um, they're, they're out at uh, Guitar Center right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I like, uh, I, I obviously am partial my GNLs to the S500 pickups. If I found a conventional Strat that had like a 12 inch radius and had the right pickups, that might dissuade me. I was hoping, and, and I'll admit this here for the first time, I was hoping the Ibanez AZ would dissuade me for my GNLs. It has not. Um, I know key, we talked about the Kiesel Delos. Like the more I look at those, the more I think that may be a way, a path forward for me is to spec my own um, Stratolite from them because they go 12, 14 inch radius. I think they even have, I think they even do a 10, um, 10, 12, 14. And then you can get whatever neck woods and body woods you want, which, which is another whole other thing. I don't even talk about what body woods need to be in, in my strats. Like um, I am partial to warmer woods in Stratocasters as well, which is kind of weird, but um, ultimately like the, the point is that it's really about the electronics more than anything. Um, yeah. I've been looking at the AZ prestiges, so I'm hoping to get one in my hand while we're at uh, Sweetwater. And um, the rep. only Jim, the only thing I didn't like about them is the baked maple neck. It gets waxy. I'm not a fan of baked maple at all. At all, I would rather do like plain unfinished maple or like satin finish or like a real light tongue oil or something like that. Yep. Um, it's not to let the wood breathe; it's all for playability and feel. So, when you say waxy, it gets sticky and you kind of like it, kind of prevents you from moving. Explain no, waxy. No, it actually feels like there's a coat of wax on it, and not wax like car wax, but like candle wax. And it, I wouldn't say it makes, makes you stick because once it warms up and like you, you get used to it, it's actually more like an unfinished neck than you'd think. But, the, but it's just a strange feeling. It's distracting. That, that's why, why I didn't like it. It feels like the, the, there's actually like oil coming out of the neck. It's, it's a very strange sensation, at least the ones that I've played. So I've played two AZs now. Um, I've, been, I've been hoping that something would convince me not to want another CE 24, but I think that's what's going to happen as I'll just get a second CE 24. There's nothing wrong with it. And, and you know, honestly, like the scale length of the strat, it's 25 and a half inch. I wish it was 25. I don't want a Gibson scale length. Every time I go to a Gibson, I'm like, what am I doing here? Um, and I kind of have to like relearn a, a couple of things. 
but I feel like if it were 25 inch, I'd be fine. So what it's worth. I wonder if Kiesel would make me a 25 inch. <laughs> I'm sure he would. Yeah. I'd probably charge me five grand for it. Let me get me started on that guy lately. Oh, really? I, Hey, I'm apparently I'm a, 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 what a, a pro fan or whatever the Facebook thing is for Kiesel, even though I'm super critical of Jeff Kiesel. And uh, apparently they think that because I've been in their group and have, have slammed some of their people that I'm like a big supporter of their thing. I don't know. Well, look at this. I mean, you know, again, we've talked about that before. So um, it's, it's always a, a, a give and take when it comes to the, the personality of the uh, person. Uh, we started right off with that. Personality does matter to some people. And, and Jeff, uh, can be polarizing. Can we can we talk about a guy that I'm kind of like reversing my opinion on? Yeah, go ahead. So we've so I bitched and bitched about JHS, yep. and Josh Scott, and like I don't I'm not going to say I like the guy. I just feel like now I've seen how he handled the Ryan Adams thing, which is a big part of this. Like that that said something to me. Um, and it was funny cause I was watching his, his vlog. I don't, some of his stuff's kind of funny. Like if you watch this thing, he's like a pedal historian right. and he'll take you back and he'll show you stuff you didn't know existed. And that's cool. Like, I really enjoy that part of the show, but yeah. then he does other things. I'm like, eh, I don't, I'm not a big fan. Um, or he'll say things that I just like strongly disagree with. Like he, today he was talking about how, uh, or on this, this episode I was watching, it wasn't today. It was, it was an old episode. He was talking about pedals with metal in the title. And um, he, of course, had like 10 metal zones and all this different stuff. And like he had he had some crazy ones. There were some really good pedals in there that were hilarious. Um, but he he pulled out. A, he was talking about the HM2, the heavy metal, too. And with with a guitar player from like Devil Plays Prada or somebody like that. And he was going on about how, you know, he didn't think they didn't think that metal pedals really had that much of a place in metal music. And I was laughing because I'm like. What about the HM2? It defined the sound of an entire genre of metal. Like that was that they, they took a heavy metal HM2 pedal, dimed it, and then ran it into like crappy marshals and stuff like solid state amps and just gained them out. And then a lot of times they'd mix it with a DS1. Maybe you would talk about tonal connoisseur right there. Think about that. Heavy metal two with a DS1. And those sound those records sound really good. And yeah, I man. Yeah. Kish, you got something to say? By the HM2? I know you want one. <laughs> oh, I really, really want one. Yeah, yeah. That, we're we're, we're going to find you an HM2. Yeah. I do need to play it first, though. How do you feel about clones? I'm actually contemplating building one. Just build one. It'll be good right. enough. Trust me. Right. I mean, I'm not really going to use it. I still want an actual one. Just kind of sentimental type thing yeah yeah yeah. well you know what they buy them now before they go up in price oh yeah you know what's going to happen though right they're going to they're going to do a waza hm2 so what did uh how did um, jhs handle the uh the brian Adam, the ryan adams thing because i know they, they pulled all the pedals they pulled all the pedals um almost immediately before like it got out of control and then the next day he issued a statement basically saying like we're not convicting anybody here or anything like that, but we've decided to distance ourselves with, with Ryan Adams and our relationship with him. Him and Ryan Adams were close. They were friends. He mentioned him in that video uh, uh, as uh, like recommending his record of the week or whatever. And if you think about that, like that's a tough decision to make. If you're, if you, you know, have a personal relationship with somebody that you're also doing business with that you have to like, you have to distance yourself there. And Josh doesn't feel like just watching his videos. He does not feel like a mega monopoly, like entrepreneur. He feels like a guy that's kind of stumbling through this and just happens to be successful at it. Um, whereas a lot of guys that stumble through it, you kind of still stay in their closet and they, you know, they're still like operating out of their garage or whatever. He's got an actual factory. He's got people who work for him. He's found a good niche. And I know he sells a lot to P dubs. That's his niche. Like that's okay. That's we, there's a whole industry of stuff that's, that's focused on that. Um, and that's, I, I have, I have zero problems with that, but it, he, um, my, my whole, my whole issue with him originally is like, he's knocking off all these pedal designs and, and I'm, I'm sure he probably still is doing that to an extent, 
but I've seen some stuff that have come out of them recently that I really liked. They were just kind of novel concepts. Um, he had a, he has a pedal now called the haunting mids, which is just a mid boost. And like that, that right there, I mean, what do you buy a tube screamer for to use it as a mid boost? So like, honestly, like it's, it's not a super genius move to be like, I'm going to make a mid boost pedal. It's nothing more than like a fixed Q mid boost. Um, he's done a couple of things that are just kind of novel like that. I don't like their pricing. I think, um, <laughs> they sell the thing called a little black box. And what that's, what that's for, you, you take your effects send out, run it through the black box and then run it and run the effects send back in to the return. And it's just a volume knob that you can put in your effects loop so that you can control the amount of, um, well, it's, they, they, they say it's like a poor man's attenuator, but really what it does is it makes your, your input volume a lot more sensitive or a lot less sensitive. So you can turn it up higher and get more, more play out of the pedal range it's a common thing for hot rod deluxes anybody who's played a hot rod deluxe you guys played hot rod deluxes mm -hmm. no, never what yeah. so so you had a you had a um i had deville yeah deville how sensitive was that volume now between zero and one like extreme yeah was, like uh, to an unbelievable level <laughs> and and yeah and between one and two it was like um so nothing happened <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and you would have this explosion of sound after that. <laughs> it's like, so it had to get to a certain point. Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so the reason why I say this is because, like, that's what that pedal is meant to do is to make it so that you can use a hot rod deluxe. Yep. In that first peg of volume, and you can shift it to be zero to four is right. your is your home level volumes, right? Um. And that's that's super cool. I've been thinking about buying one, but you know how much they want for one of those? No. Forty dollars for a potentiometer in a little a little finger enclosure. Is it just a potentiometer? I mean, it doesn't have like I, a, doesn't I have can't a imagine there's anything else in it. That's what they used to be when you would find them on eBay. Was like literally like a potentiometer and like wires. <laughs> I mean. So I'm going to say this. So there was a there was a lot of controversy when I was in the early days of the of the internet in the early 2000s, back when dinosaurs were roaming the world and people were still listening to cassettes. Um, there, we would go online and go onto these things called forums, right? But anyway, so I'm in these forums, especially Harmony Central, and um, the discussion was: Can you can you tame your hot rod? Hot rod you know the bill blocks and and everybody was like oh yeah you just throw a potentiometer in there and you, just, you know but a lot of people who use those things the problem is uh, um now this i didn't do it myself so i can't speak directly to it but a lot of people were saying yeah you can do that but then your tubes are going to get saturated more and pull there would be more pull on the tubes than there would just for the speaker and that that um your tube life suffered greatly for it that's well, that's for an attenuator. An attenuator would, would cause your tubes to blow out faster. Well, that's what a, a pot is going to do in line, is going to attenuate. No, all well, it's going to do, your, so, your, so your power amp tubes are going are gonna to cook the same way you would wherever the master's set. Makes no difference. All it's going to do is make that, that volume that hits the power tubes and adjust that. Actually, if anything, your preamp tubes. If you're so, if you're in a class AB amplifier where it's switching back and forth, you know, um, as each part of the waveform, um, and you have the master set at five, and you have your your preamp gain set at like zero, your, the heat on those tubes is not going to be that bad. It's if you're running in true class A, where the where the tubes are always hitting hard, regardless of what's being flown through them, that that's going to be horrendous. So his his pedal goes where in the in the um, it's an effects loop, yeah. It's not an attenuator. It goes in the effects loop. You can't put a pot in the attenuator. That would, that would blow up your amp, like, almost immediately. No, that, you have to have a resistor. You have to have a resistor there that can handle the heat. If right. you don't have any resistor, if you're just running it to ground, that's dangerous. You could kill yourself. <laughs> not, not to mention blow up your transformers. Um, don't do that. <laughs> don't. <laughs> so, um, but... That's one of those things that, like, if you put it in the effects loop, all it's doing is just affecting the level of the preamp hitting the power amp tubes. The power amp tubes are still, even the worst case, are just going to be getting the same amount of wear as wherever your master is set normally. Um, 
if anything, if you're not hitting them as hard with input volume, they shouldn't get as hot because heat is the enemy. They should just be fine. It's not, it's not an attenuator where you crank them up to what, you know, you're actually running a hundred Watts through it. And then you're just putting it in, you know, taking off a lot of the energy of that and then sending the rest out to your speakers. It's a little bit different. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, so they're attenuating the pre tubes. Yeah. Well, they're not attenuating anything. All they're doing is isn't lowering that, the volume level. Isn't that effectively like if I put a, um, if I put a boost in my um, yeah and then turn the boost down and then same turn idea the down. same right. idea yes absolutely absolutely um and it's that's been a thing for a while like they've had poor man's attenuators on ebay forever yeah you know, some guy in his house like i'll just make a quick couple of books i got some potentiometers laying around he makes 10 of them puts one on ebay sells them out um and then of course you know the poor schmo who doesn't know anything about guitar buys them plugs them in thinks this is great doesn't realize that he's not getting an attenuator per se. Um, right. And maybe some people have done what you've done, what you were thinking, Jim is like, plug the plug, plug it in between the, the uh, head and the cabinet. And yeah, they have completely been. destroyed your amp in the process. Well, no, there were a lot of people doing the, there, there's a mod out there. Um, I'll, I'll look it up and post it, but the, uh, the mod was, you put, uh, it was like a variac. Oh yeah. No, but that's, that's a, called a, either a rheostat attenuator, or you can use a variac to lower the voltage level, um, or you can even um, you can make an L pad, which is basically just a resistor with different taps on it. Right. Um, and those are all effective forms, provided that you get the right the one that can handle the amount of power so it doesn't melt. I mean, um, that's why you buy a Doctor Z air brake. It's basically nothing more than a giant resistor yeah. inside a case and it just pays heat. That's all it is. Yep. So anyway, um, yeah, so I'm looking at JHS and like not everything they do attracts me. There's a lot of things they do that I think are kind of silly. Um, like they have the, the crayon that doesn't do anything for me, but some of their problems, no, like they, I, had the, they had something called the, the v, VCR or something. Was that, uh, that was the Ryan Adams pedal. Yeah. That's what they discontinued. That is no longer available. So that's going to bri- drive the price of it up, and he's going to eventually have to release it as something else. Uh, they were already talking about they're going to they're going to they're in the process of trying to figure out how they're going to rebrand it and sell it off because they do have stock. They know they need to fix them, and they can't sell them with Ryan Adams' name on it. And I'm sure there's good, there's a contract thing with Ryan Adams too. Well, there there is, but usually, um, v- various other people pointed this out that there's usually an escape clause. Yeah, for almost for, all of this kind of stuff and a lot of times these endorsement deals it's literally the, the escape clauses the the company that is endorsing you can pull the plug at any moment yeah. so um and i wouldn't be surprised if that's not a similar situation here it looks like josh has sure. some pretty good lawyers to sure. handle his his end of things because uh his company if you haven't like been following along they have taken off very quickly and they're in bed with a lot of the other boutique builders. I think Josh used to work for um, um, uh, Josh or for Keeley, for Robert Keeley. I oh, think, right. yeah, I think it's where he came from. Um, but I mean, not everything. Like, if it's a straight clone, I'm not that interested. I, he's like a super bolt as a super odo. There's a there's a free free schematic and parts list you can get, and you can go build that pedal yourself. Um, why would you want to? you know, buy his version of it other than you don't want to build a pedal. Like some people are, I mean, it, uh, I, I know for my, my own um, experience when I was making a lot of money, um, it was like, why would I go and spend 10 minutes doing that? I can just spend a hundred. Oh, no, 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 Jim. Jim I, I know. I understand. But my point is like, in this case, you're not giving credit to the original designer who came up with this. They're building it and they stole the schematic for free. Because it's an electronic design. It's an electronic circuit. So for those of you who don't know, um, you can basically clone an electronic circuit. And there's no copyright issue there unless there's something patented. Right. It's not going to be a problem. And my understanding of the patent law is you patent the function, not the way you did it. Right. So, yeah. Uh, That's why JHS is not in legal trouble for some of the stuff they've done, which is basically like, straight up cloning pedals the uh the kilt is a straight up clone of a bionics or a bixonic expandora um 
nobody says anything because they're basically cloning the circuit and that's allowed. Yeah. So um, if, if circuits couldn't be cloned, we wouldn't have Mesa. We wouldn't have Marshall. We wouldn't have there'd be a lot of things that we wouldn't have. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's uh, Marshall is probably the biggest one. Yeah. Um, because the, you know, the, even the original, uh, the original Princeton based Mesa's were a shadow of what they were originally right. um, when they were being sold. So, yeah, but but absolutely, like Marshall, straight up knock off a Fender Baseman, like 100%, except for the tube types. Yep. They would have lost that lawsuit all day long. So I, I think it's cool that, that these designers get to do that. Um, I have seen shootouts between, like, some of the JHS stuff where they're like, look, it's, uh, it doesn't sound identical to this, but it, the, the difference is so minuscule. It's like that could just be the fact that they use different jacks. I mean, it's it's the, like to that level of they're basically the same. Yeah. Um, well, look at look at guitars. I mean, you know how many how many guitars out there look like an SG? How many look like a Strat? I yeah. think we talked about that the other day. There's only like f- um, four. Yeah, there's like four or five body types. It's right. just ridiculous. Telecaster, Les Paul. Eighty percent uh, of your guitars in existence Caster, are yeah SG. these four, right? Yeah. Um, I don't like I don't like the JHS art. I will say that much. Yeah. I think, I think what solid color. Yeah. How many look like PRS? Everything. Yeah. Nothing. Everything. Everything. John, John just said, it's just in the yeah. group. How, how many look like a PRS? <laughs> Cause a PRS is supposed to look like everything. Yeah. It has, not- the, it has some of the shape of the fender, some of the shape of a Gibson Les Paul. Um, and then even when you get into the, the single cuts, like they start to look like, Jazz masters and Jack. Well, when you first, when you, when he went to try to get um, Carlos album. Santana yeah. to play it, Star it was Wars. like, please, please play my guitar. He had to give him something that looked kind of like what he was playing. He was playing Gibson. I'm not, I'm not debating whether it's good or not. I'm just saying we have classic designs for a reason. Oh yeah, they uh, work. Right. Don't don't fix what ain't broke. I'll tell you who fixed something that that was broken that I really like. Um, I'm doing the demo for the Wumbler Velvet Fuzz. It's on the floor underneath my desk. I'm looking at it. Um, it has a foot switch with a uh, like a by- true bypass relay on it. That's the way it should be done. It, yeah, it's pretty cool. Silent. Um, they all they did was they put a little bit of a a delay when you hit the pedal, but like it's not a noticeable delay. It's just enough to get around that pop. It happens if you've ever used true bypass pedals, and it works really good. The only thing I don't like about it is the battery drain issue. Like it seems like all of their pedals just eat batteries. Yep. If you actually do run on nine volts, I've been running them on, on nine volt for the demos. And it just like, if I leave the cable plugged in, walk away for an hour, it's yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> I've cut back to a dead battery already while I'm doing the demo. Yep. So. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> and the it's funny thing funny. is I can pull the battery out and put it in a boss pedal, a boss pedal run for like another eight days. Yeah, I, I've got, yeah, my, my, my Wampler Paisley Deluxe still has the original battery and I'm too lazy to open it up. <laughs> well, you know, and the funny part is a lot of people don't realize this. If you're building pedals yourself, if you leave an, if you leave an LED out, it'll last forever because the LED is what burns most of the, most of the 9-volt battery off. Um, yeah. My Sunface has the original battery in it. And I've left that thing plugged in and turned on like overnight right. several times. Wow. <laughs> and it just will not die. So no, thumbs up to uh, Mike there. Yeah, well that the fuzz face is just an incredibly like efficient circuit battery wise anyway. Yeah. So that's that's a big part of it. He says that the he says that the original battery should last like three years or whatever. Wow. So um anyway. Yeah, I know I didn't know. Don't take me saying like I'm kind of warming up to JHS. Like it's like, I'm going to start running out and buying JHS pedals. Like they're uh, most of what they sell is not aimed at me. Um, it's not all that interesting. Like the only pedals I really kind of am interested in is I, I think the haunting Miz is a cool idea because it's so novel. And um, I, I do have like the angry Charlie circuit and the, um, the angry driver, which is over there. But uh like the tidy whitey, tidy whitey compressor. That's funny, John. That's hilarious. The tidy whitey compressor, yeah. Like, somebody, somebody did a demo on that, and it actually, oh, you know who it was? It was Music Is Wind. It was Tyler Larson. He did a demo on that. And it actually was really good. It's just a, it's just a Ross compressor clone with a blend knob. Yeah. Like, 
you can buy that anywhere. <laughs> um, I, I some of the other things he's done though are kind of cool, like the milk, uh, the milk compressor, or whatever. No, that's not a compressor. That's the that's the EQ thing, the the delay. Um, right? Yeah, I think so. I he's he has another compressor, the orange squeeze. That's actually really cool. Um, that is a that is a really good four knob Ross clone that I think is actually better than the the Keeley one. But now Keeley has a compressor plus, which is better than that. So it was almost like when Keeley got bumped off, he's like, "All right, we got to fix this." <laughs> so, um, yeah, they have the they do have the modded op amp muff. Uh, you, know, you guys can talk in the group, like you guys are on the episode. It's okay. <laughs> I'm feeding you guys. I'm feeding you. Yeah. So. <laughs> John feels the need to like give uh, Jim gas by showing him that the op amp big muff has a mod from JHS. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. So, all right. Well, yeah, I've got no, I've got no, um, I really don't want to change it. I like it the way it is. Um, and I, I and I, and John right in the beginnings pointed out that I said all, my, all, all fuzzes suck. So yeah, I, I had to say that I was listening to back episodes and I heard that and I'm like, Oh, I got to bring that one up. <laughs> it's well, true. So the mod is fifty bucks, Jim. Yep. What it gives you is you get a you get a toggle switch on the side, and you get an additional knob on the side, and it gives you a gate toggle down, which is stock op amp big muff distortion. It's like just stock settings, right? And then gate toggle middle up in the middle setting is the highest gate setting. So that's going to give you your gated fuzz, like really ridiculously clipped off fuzz. Not something I think you'd be into. And then the the up is the lower gate setting, which means like you're going to have no, none of the Velcro like quality at all. It's going to, it's going to be more open and more, um, I, I guess less refined, yeah. um, than you, than it would be stock. So I don't know that this is a mod for you <laughs> now. Yeah. So I've been using the, uh, obviously the electro harmonics fuzz. I'm enjoying the, um, the use of it. And I've been using the fuzz setting, the Pi fuzz setting in the, um, Helix FX, which yeah. I've really enjoyed. So um, I've got two of them that I've kind of warmed up to. But the HX FX, I'm willing to bet you that the HF, HX FX, that's six times fast, um, the Helix FX um, but Pi probably isn't exactly what I would get if I just pulled a Pi out of a muff. No, because it's a, tri- it's a triangle muff. You'd have to buy the triangle muff for your issue. Yeah. And so I kind of like, that's probably why. Um, and it, but I've been using that compulsive drive in there a lot. So. OCD is a great pedal, man. Um, I, like I told you, though, the only thing I've ever had a problem with the OCD is that it's got way too much presence. Um, yeah. That's that crazy upper high end harmonic thing. Like you almost have to run an EQ pedal after it. It's it's pretty vicious. The thing I can say about the PRS is, and John can John can come in uh, if he wants for this, uh, is that for at least the CE twenty four, the the um, pickups are dark enough. That in reality, I almost need more treble in my in sure. My pain, where I, I can take the same settings, plug in the SG, and it sounds like like. Oh yeah, no, no, harsh, for sure. And what I'm talking about is not really like the what we would think of like the normal guitar frequencies. It's the stuff that disappears in a band mix on the really upper high end. Um. So they do, like I said, they do sound great in a band mix, but like if you're playing around your house, you almost have to have an EQ after it. Yeah. That, that stuff that's really up there is like razor blades. It's really, really like cutting. Um, and it's not frequencies that are pleasant to hear from the guitar. Right. Um, right. You're probably using the, the V2 in the, the HXFX though. The V4 is the one that's currently out, yeah. which is really like V5 now or whatever. They, 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 their numbering convention does not match the internal numbering convention. Um, and I would say the one that's out right now, my, my buddy's got one. It's probably the best one they've ever done. Um, OCD. yeah, the current version is really, really good. It's not modeled in the helix. It has a, a great buffer on it. You can turn the buffer on and off, which is another nice feature. And it had, they've done something to the high end. It's not as, it's not nearly as crazy as it was. Yeah. I'm sure we'll get a new, uh, a new series. So, oh. uh, Oh, I don't think they're going to model any more of those, to be honest with you. I, I really don't. No CD? Because the V2 is the sought-after one. Yeah. That's the one everybody wants. That's the one I'm using. So, I mean, they, they, maybe they'll pull some punches and they'll, like, release the ne- not this patch, but the next patch will have it, but I doubt it. I doubt they'll even touch it. 
not until 10 years and when they're actually sought after, like people are buying yeah. V2s. Um, I don't know. I mean, do you guys have like favorite overdrive pedals that uh, they've had multiple versions or whatever? Cause we're talking about the OCD and the, um, the big muff, like big those muff. are the two pedals that everyone knows have like 500 different versions. Um, cause of the running changes they've made on them and stuff. I Kish is like, Kish is like rolling his eyes at me. He's like, I don't, I don't play pedals. I have, I have a processor that I use for everything. That's fine. No, we're not, we're not disputing that. I'm just, you know, it's cool. To, it's cool to know this stuff though, because when you're talking to somebody, like at least, you know, you can understand that, Hey, this, big muff is like totally different than this other one and they really are different like that's that's the thing that got me when i first started getting into gear and being like very specific about what you would check i would go and i would actually like watch videos where they do side-by-side comparisons and a lot of times they would be like so minuscule it would be ridiculous and, and pointless to talk about but then i saw gear man dude shoot out the ocds they are all completely different and then i saw a video comparing big muffs like Russian versus Civil War versus, um, you know, the Big Muff Pie reissue versus the original and then versus like Triangle Muffs. And they are all very different pedals. Um, I think the fuzz pedals are actually a little bit harder to get into because number one, it's a lot harder to find all the different variations. But number two, um, a feel is a big part of what makes those pedals different. Um, they do feel very different. Like a Russian, talk about that Russian that I played that was like falling apart. Um, every Russian muff I've ever played looked like it was falling apart. Look, it, it it looked like it had been through the Soviet Union, but been dragged behind a horse and uh, through the snow and the dirt. Um, now I've seen knobs cracked on them. Like, what what did you do to crack the knob? Um, but the point is that those are my favorites because they sound way more like an earlier fuzz than the rest of the must do because they're like mismatched and their the component selection is like whatever they had on hand. Um, and they're all, and they're all completely different. And that's the other thing I found is like you pick up one black Russian muff and then another one and they're night and day different, but I could play Jimi Hendrix stuff on those muffs. I could not play Jimi Hendrix stuff on the muff that you have, Jim, the, the op amp muff. It's just a whole nother animal. By the way, do you prefer the op amp, op amp on or off? Oh, it's on. Yeah, I figured. I figured that's um, what you'd like. So, so John just sent me a, a fuzz pedal. He, he's trying, he's coding me. Um, and it has a sandwich on it. It's from JHS. Oh, the muffletta. The muffletta. Every muff in a box. Yeah. And, and it's supposed just, to be every muff in a box. You couldn't do that. I just thought it was funny. Because it's, I'm sure it's supposed to be a meatball sandwich, but it looks like a shit sandwich. I'm just saying. It's, it's a smorgasbord. <laughs> the artwork doesn't work. Looks like a steaming pile of crap. So I'll, let me see if I can if I can zoom in close enough on the pedal picture. I want to be able to go through all the different muffs that are on here. So there's a triangle. There's He's a big muff. There's a pie. There's a triangle. There's a Civil War muff. Yep. Ram's um, head. And there's a ram's head. And then, of course, the JHS equivalent. What is yeah. the Canon? The Russian. Oh, no, no. The, the Russian is the star. The Canon is the Civil War. The Russian is the star. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I th- I've heard people love these things, the Muffletta. Yeah. I honestly, like, muffs aren't that expensive if you want anything that isn't a triangle muff or, like, some super weird obscure like a rare weird one so i would just probably buy the original but yeah. uh, granted if i bought uh if i bought a russian muff like it would probably as i said be drug on a horse through moscow you know during the snowy season um i this may be more attractive to that and if you look at the if you the one thing i want to point out this he's a pedal lover and he and he does stuff like this it's a black pedal with yellow which is the colors that are on the the russian muff so he's he's selected that on purpose yeah. like he's trying to say something that that's what he prefers or um so or i would maybe what it does best or something or maybe that's what the the, the circuit they modified to get it to sound like all the others you know yes. that could be um i will say one thing though jhs the one thing i don't like all their pedals are um service mount now which means you can't mod them <laughs> well they're harder to mod you can mod them trust me people will do it have have pedal stuff will mod um but 
they're they're going to be harder to repair. So if something did go bad and like you're 20 years down the line, you can't get another one of these. And this is like the pedal you need. Forget it. Like just chuck it in the garbage. Cause unless you've got somebody that can do surface mount, like it's basically done for. Um, he does. I do notice like though, even though that there are surface mount, the switches and stuff are all uh, through hole. So at least that stuff is, is still salvageable. Yeah. So uh, Stephen Conradi, um, he shared that he likes the Emerson Custom EM Drive. Transfer. That's a cool pedal. Yeah, the, yeah. the M Drive. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So I'm not. I'm not a big drive pedal guy. Um, I never really have been. Uh, I always felt like when I was growing up, everybody had these overdrive pedals. Um, and like, oh, the tube screamer or, oh, the, the, you know, I don't know this is the M drive, but like the OCD or the, um, what's the, 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 uh, the blue one that's inside the angry driver, um, the blues, the blues, um, there are all these different like archetypal effects that people loved. And I was just like, dude, where do I get my MI audio crunch box or something like that? I just want, I just want something that sounds like a Marshall. Like, I don't care about your your flavor of drive i just need to get i need to get enough volume and and saturation to like do the marshall thing now i i have found that so for saturating um i prefer stack drives for saturation versus um stacking drives versus uh uh using a compressor right it's, right it's just something about like i i literally um that my wampler uh modded blues driver with the um, underdog side of the um, the Paisley Deluxe, and then put it into the drive um, channel, the vintage um, uh, channel of the Amp One to super saturate the crap out of it. <laughs> and and uh, I actually love that tone. Yeah, dude, like that's stack and drive right there. Yeah, um, I think I think I do better. And this is going to sound really crazy because I never, I never aspired to be this person. I saw all these, these boosts years ago, come on the scene, like in the mid or late nineties, early two thousands. And I'm like, this does nothing for me. Like I'm not into, uh, why would I want a clean boost? Like I knew you could saturate the front end of the amp with a clean boost. Like I, I got it. And I knew you could use it in a loop to get a volume boost, but I just like, I don't No, It's not the only reason you use it, Jim. That's the only reason you use it. But, I said, you, me. That's what I said. Oh, oh I thought you said I, that was the only reason to no, use it. I'm like, no, I use it. That's oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> Cause, um, that sound, especially in like shred and metal music is to boost an amp some way. Like even one that's like fully gained out. Look, we're talking about the heavy metal distortion. Dude, there's an entire subgenre of metal that is based on, taking what is the equivalent of like the metal zone before the metal zone and just cranking it to 10 and running it into a fully distorted amp. Right. I mean, balls to the wall distortion at that point yeah. um, to the point where it sounds lo-fi, which yep. is what's cool about it. Um, I've had great success, great success with my uh, Mark five twenty five and running a tube screamer into it and just like using that as a mid, uh, mid hump. Mm -hmm. Um, and I get made fun of in the Mesa Boogie group because I brought it up to several people. Like there's this whole thing and they're like, I don't, you don't need drive pedals. You have a Mesa Boogie. And I just laugh and I'm like, dude, you don't even know what you're missing. Like yeah. you can tell me that all day long. Hey, you, you go find me a metal stage where people are using dual Rex and they ain't boosting them with a, with a tube screamer. They all do it. I, you know, that comes back to one of the things is the style of music you play. Oh yeah, it totally dictates. Nobody's going to use stacked overdrives to get a good country compressed sound or a metal sound for that matter. They're gonna I, they're gonna push an amp, you know. I mean, yeah. So it, it's it's more of a what are you trying to accomplish? You know, I I liked you saw the Vernon Reed thing today, right? Yeah, yeah. And Vernon was talking about the fact that he uses the Helix, but it's a tool in his toolbox. There are other things that he really likes, and so on and so forth. And the, and the um, Line 6 guy said, yeah, we understand that. It's, it's like you have a blender, but you still need other things, and you still might need to whip things with your hand blender. Just because you have a, a really good one blender doesn't mean it does everything right. And you still got to um, uh, find those niches 
that you'll use other stuff for. Um, just, I, just I have a question for, for the uh, listener participation. Let's go around the group and let's talk about one piece of gear that, that people get excited about that you think is crappy or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's All right, Jim, you, you I start. I want to go last. I want to go last. Are right, you going to go last? <laughs> um, I'll start then. I'll start. Uh, we actually, you know what? I, I thought of the question, but like, I don't really, I mean, I guess I could, I, there's a bunch of gear like that's this way for me. So I'm like trying to think of a good one. If I was to, if I was to just throw one out there, I don't like dual rectifiers or triple rectifiers at all. Like I know a lot of people love them and I, I get the sound that they get. Like they're very, very good at what they do, but that sound just does nothing for me. There's like no mid range to it, to me. Um, and I don't know how I would cut in a mix with that. I would, it would be a real challenge. I'm sure if I had one long enough, I'd start to vibe with it, but it's one of those things where it's like, why would I bother? Um, so maybe we'll come back around. I'll give one more at the end or something. Who was the Dan? You want to go? Yeah. For me, for any piece of gear that a lot of people tend to have strong feelings towards it's cables. Like they make such a small difference to me. I don't want to hear them. <laughs> it's it just doesn't matter most of the time. I would agree with you most of the time. However, I I just ordered um I ordered the Boss Wireless, and uh, it hasn't arrived yet. It'll be it'll be here tomorrow or the next day. Um, and I will say that I listened to some clips of some people playing the Boss Wireless versus an actual cable because it has built-in wire it has built-in wire tone or whatever they call it cable tone L listen uh the funny thing was even though it has built-in cable tone it sounded nothing like the cable they ab'd it with nothing and i was just like if this was in a forum it was on the gear page and the guy was like no this is using this cable and like we're just run direct into the to the interface and you could hear it was a night and day difference but i think that's a bigger issue than like wireless versus wired versus you know cable 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 i think cables are more about reliability and yes they do sound different but i think like you said it's such a minuscule difference hierarchy of tone i'd much rather change my speakers than worry about quality of cables so john yeah so i'm buying and selling pedals all the time i'm you know i've been doing a lot with with overdrive and distortion and all kinds of things i posted in our our chat there at one point in time i did have one of those uh those heavy metal drives i mean from a long time ago when i started i had it when i was a kid and it basically sat around you know but it it just the sound of it was just so through the amp i was using it was just so shrilly and I just, the, the HM2. You know, I like distortion but the h it, i think it was i don't know hm2 or hm3 hm2 that yeah um, so the hm2 is discontinued and then the metal zone followed it up yeah yeah so um yeah, so I I bought that, you know, got a little out of it, but it really wasn't much. Um, the HM2s are notorious for sounding terrible. Mm -hmm. If you don't use them to boost like a, a valve state or something, something weird like that, they're going to sound awful. They're they're the way that they get used in Swedish death metal is really the only reason that, that anybody's buying them. I mean, that's I the other thing is I didn't know if you knew this, John. That's a rat. Oh really? Yeah, okay. it's 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 a like a trumped up rat inside. So hmm. anyway. yeah, I've also, I've, also, I've thought about picking one of those up just to see how different that was. You know, um, the other thing I had at one point in time was an M MXR FET driver, FET driver, and mm -hmm. just the sound I just could not, I couldn't dial it in. It was just too shrilly. It just I just didn't like it. You know, so I flipped it. But other than that, I'm still exploring. You know. I've, I've got a book. I still have a bunch of different drives. I'm starting to get into some fuzz, um, messing around with that. What, what are you, what are you running for fuzz? I have to ask. It's a fetish. Well, you, you basically <laughs> steered me towards a, a sun face and I, I ended up finding one. Did you get one? I got one. Is, yeah. it, NK, is it NKT? It is an NKT. Yes, it is an oh. NKT. Yes. Oh. Did you pay like 500 bucks for it? No, I didn't. I paid a lot less. I was able to get it for, you know, I think it was around three. You know, no, that's not bad. That's what they you know, go and that was, That's what you know. That's what I thought. Um, so I've been messing with that. I also picked up a um, uh, an Earthquaker uh, Black Ash, which is you know it's very yeah, similar. I remember, but I remember you is posting that. I think it was yeah. Cool. At some point, I want to send that to you and have you mess around with it if you want. Um, so I got this. I got this guy from um, um, from uh, Jason. 
And this is the creepy face from uh, Creepy Fingers. I'm holding it up to the group, but it's a blue pedal. It's got three knobs. Uh, it has an off or creepy switch. So it's so it's actually, you can hear it clicking. That is literally uh, bypassing the, the bias knob on, on like a sun face. Now, the cool part that the uh, sundial, you know, I don't know yeah. if he has a sundial, but that's like a common yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, this pedal, if I put it up next to my sun face, it's identical. I, it's the same thing. And I, I mean, when I say identical, like I can't tell a difference except for this creepy knob. And when you click that thing off, it, it's, it, you have more throw in the control for one thing that it has more range than what's in the uh, sun, sundial. But number two, when you click it off, it's like having that sundial removed from the circuit. And it's really, really cool. Oh, that's cool. Um, but I don't know if these are even made anymore. Um, I'm really excited to, to do the demo for this. I've, been, I've actually been holding off on this one because I really want to give it as just desserts. Um, that's what, uh, next to my sun face, that's the coolest fuzz face I've ever played. Excellent. So. Yeah, so that kind of switched it from the crappy stuff to the good stuff. But <laughs> um, Yeah, well, I mean, we all have, like, it's, I think it's easier to find the stuff that vibes for us and, and call it good, you know what I mean? Like, I, I know that if I gave Jim my sun face, he's going to be like, ugh. Um, I'm going to bring it to Gear Not Fest, though. I want to let him play it at Gear Fest. I'm, I'm going to bring it. I'm probably going to bring a couple of fuzz pedals because I, I think Jim needs some exposure. I think he needs to see, like, not all fuzz is like a fuzz factory. They're not all treated the same, right? The, oh, yeah. No, they're not. I mean, well, you, so, John, have you, have, you, have you experimented with a fuzz factory before? No, I haven't. Okay. No. So, so the fuzz factory is a noisemaker. Um, I'm sure listeners of the show will probably know what this is, but if you don't, it's a noisemaker. It will literally squeal on its own if you let it. Um, and it has, what they did is they took a, they took a fuzz face. It's like the simplest circuit in the world. There's like five resistors or something in it. And they, and they added a knob instead of each resistor. So it's a variable resistor and then allowed you to have complete control over the way that the components interact. Um, so it yields all these like crazy, stupid sound effects and, um, you can just do insane stuff with it. But the problem is it, it doesn't have a conventional use. And so a lot of people hate them. Um, I wish, uh, uh, Robert was able to make it from Guitar Dungeon tonight, but he's he, he has a video where he he demoed it and he and it's a comedy video. Like he's making fun of the fact that like he doesn't like it, he doesn't get anything out of it, and everybody knows it, and that's fine. Um, I I had one for a while, and I'm a fuzz guy, and I had the same reaction. It was like this is a useless pedal because it, two reasons. Number one is it's just a noisemaker, which if I want a noisemaker, this is not the kind of noise I want to make. I'll get a I'll get an octave fuzz, um, and then and then play it like a ring mod, um. And then the other one is the um, um, that it, it the knobs are so sensitive that it would be hard to do the same tone twice. So, um, <laughs> I'm gonna read. Uh, should I read this? Oh, uh, I'm gonna read. I Kish had to take off. It's he's he's ending his night this evening. So I'm gonna read his final message to the chat to to the group. And that is, it's late for me. It's been fun. Enjoy the rest of your night. But he's going to leave us with a joke, and that is, why bury guitar players six feet under? Because deep down, they're all very nice people. <laughs> uh, I'll have to tell that one to my therapist. Yeah. All right, so I'm going I'm to say what piece of gear that I would be least excited to see uh, or excited about. Um, first of all, I can't get excited about everything, uh, about things that everybody gets excited about. Yeah, and it seems like, and I've said this on the show, uh, Jim. You have you have intentionally. I, I'll tell you this, and, and you, this is an observation. I'm not I'm not pointing a finger. And you're making fun of you. I'm gonna let you come back to your thing here in a second. Um, but you have there have been times where you have intentionally came out against something just because it's hyped up, and I'm like I'm like yeah, but once you see it and like you actually use it, you're gonna have a whole different opinion. And there have been times where you have, but most <laughs> of the time, not. and. So here's the thing. Every time somebody comes out with a compressor, it's like, oh, this compressor is 10 times better than that compressor. Oh, this is the best compressor we've ever made. We've been making compressors for 25 years. Compressor plus. Yes. Oh, my God. It's the best compressor that's ever been. Mankind has never held a better compressor. Than There's that. only two, two compressors I like. We'll get to that. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, last, you know, I just want to say that, that it's like, 
I'm not the only gigging musician in the world. I get that. Okay. I understand. Sure. But I, I speak for almost every single friend I know who actually gigs. They don't give a crap. With their gear, it makes the sound I want. I'm going on stage. They don't give a crap about what freaking music. So most of them, it's like, what have you got on your board? Um, they have to look down. Like, yeah, know. they're like, they're like, what am I running? I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know. What kind of amp you got? I don't know. Uh, it's which a, it's, makes you think like when they're in the middle of their set what are they doing like they're playing through and they're like oh i got this lead coming up and then they look down their board like oh shit i don't have the pedal i need <laughs> <laughs> they know that they have a boost they know that this is the pedal that boosts but they, yeah, they don't know what, no it is. <laughs> what it is and if it, it and if a knob got, they, those guys have little pieces of tape or a oh. marker or yeah whatever. dude like i can't tell you how many times i've seen duct tape where they're just taping the knobs so nobody can touch them my first, my first amps, all of them, and including the one I, you know, my, my uh, Fender DeVille, all had the chalk. Market. Yeah. Because I was like, all right, I need to know where this was. And I used those little stickers after a while so that you can you know, peel it off. Well, now we know, though, that like going to different rooms, you need different settings too, though. So, I mean, like you really shouldn't, you shouldn't be that you married. Had a, you had a home setting. You knew where Yeah, to- like you kind of knew where to start. Right. And that's really just in case some little kid, which did happen. Yeah. Comes up, bumps everything. And the next thing you know, you're looking at your amp going, what the heck? I, you know, I told this story, I think before on the show where we were playing this gig and this guy was, you know, really impressing these girls. He's playing along. All of a sudden his music, just the sound just goes crap. It's like, where are we? And it's like, what the hell just happened to your tone? Come to find out one of them had stepped on his wah pedal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You and did tell that not- story. And so it, it, it all of a sudden it became, <laughs> dude, I got through an entire song one time with my wah pedal on and like half cocked and I couldn't tell. Yeah. I got through it, an entire song that way. There's a couple of places. I, uh, now that I've got this, uh, this crybaby SC, uh, the, the slash version, there's a couple of times I've turned it on just to get a cock spot. Cause I like the cue. Yeah. It me in there. But, um, anyway, there, my point is that I guess it's because, I, first of all, I was a kid who wore jeans when you weren't supposed to wear jeans, right? I had long right. hair when you weren't supposed to have long hair. Then when people had long hair, I cut my hair. When people started wearing jeans, and wore slacks. I mean, it was just the... the, the you, don't, you, you, you think you're a nonconformist, but you're conforming by being a nonconformist. Yeah, I'm conforming to the nonconformist. I, I just know, don't I give a shit hard. anymore. And, and so, you know, if you're going to be a, conform- a nonconformist, you have to do these things to be a nonconformist. Yeah, exactly. You have to conform to being nonconformist. You have to, yeah, you have to nonconform. So you have to conform to the nonconformist. But um, anyway, it's just that I can't get excited about, oh, there's this new amp. I like the sound of my freaking amp. I don't want a new amp. I like the sound of my, my guitar. I don't want them on our guitar. Yeah, I, I mean, unless it's a big feature update to something, like they're going to add. So if Mesa came out with a, with a triple crown, it was 25 watts, which would be a feature to me, and then add a cab clone to it, that sounds good. Like, I would, I would be like, okay, now I'm excited. But if Mesa was to come out and say, we're doing a new iteration of the cab clone where we're going to upgrade the circuit with nicer, nicer caps or something. Right. Like I would just shake my head and be like, this is pointless. I don't really care. I, mean, I, I honestly, the, the, the classic example is the amp one right now. Right. The, the Mercury edition could give two shits. Don't care. Nope. And if they, if, if they're selling off the ones that are not Mercury while you're there, you should grab they're gonna be the same, They're going to be the same damn price. I mean, when you think about it, um, they should, they should mark those damn things. They, might, they might, There's they might that- be in the clearance tent. I don't know. There is that thought that, oh, this is the new version. It's got to have something great in it. Well, I, and I, I, I give that as a classic example, but in, in all reality, I have heard that the, um, the Mercury has some hidden features that they've added for like diagnostic purposes and stuff that actually might be functional. Right. I just don't think they're in the manual. It might be worth it to get the Mercury for that stuff. But for, yeah. but for just buying like, Oh, it's you know it's it's a three percent improvement in tone on the on the gain channel, like. Well, yeah, I and, and so I thought care. about you know, at first I thought about well I'll get a blue box, but now I'm like you know what I can just IR load the HX specs and I'll get the same thing. Yeah, dude, now you're getting IR, it. IR, so I'll get the I'll get the um the controller for the amp one, and that's gonna be it, really. Um, so I guess the thing that that I'm saying is 
I can't get hyped up like Strymon. I just can't get hyped up about a Strymon Big Sky. I get it. I really do. I do oh. hear the difference. When I hear a Big Sky and I hear, you know, you know these other ones, I'm like, all right, I get it. I hear I, that. I, but, I, I have a closing, arg- closing thing we want to talk about. So go, yeah, go, go ahead and finish. Just, but, yeah, we do need to finish. I'm just saying that, that I, I don't hear enough that makes me want to spend as much for a Big Sky as I would for 10 other pedals. No, no, the big sky. So the Strymon big box pedals are too expensive. The Strymon small box pedals are too expensive. Um, I am lusting after an El Capistan right now. Um, but in order for that to be viable to me, like some things have got to happen. And I, and I got to sort it out for myself, but it's 300 bucks for one effect. That's silly. It's so silly when you think about it. But for me, that's and here's where we're going to get into the the final topic before we exit the show um i i think that i'm a big enough tape guy that a single really good high quality tape delay is exactly what i'm after um now here's will where it be, will it be a strike does think it's the big sky or not the big sky the um the uh, el capistan yeah um so here here's where we're, here's where I'm, where I'm going so last week News came out that T Rex is going bankrupt. Toman, yeah. in their infinite wisdom, and I have some insider information on this, and I can't share my sources or anything, and I'm not going to get too crazy with the insider info. But um, Toman went out of business. Okay, they they declared bankruptcy, uh, or not Toman, uh, T Rex declared bankruptcy. Oh. Right. So Toman, who is their European distributor, was like, "We're blowing their stuff out because your bankruptcy laws are different in Europe." They and, and Toman has a reputation for being like, oh, you're going under and you're going to screw us. We're going to screw you and we're going to sell your stuff at a discount. Yep. That's like ridiculous. We're going to sell it at cost, basically. Sometimes it'd be low cost just to screw them. So they, um, they blew out and they, they're probably still blowing out uh, T Rex inventory over on Toman. That meant tape delays. So the two tape delays they make, they make the, um, the replica and then the replica junior. Right. Uh, the replica is normally eight hundred dollars. They were selling it for four hundred twenty-five. The replica junior is normally four hundred or five hundred dollars, and they were selling it for two hundred and seventy-five or two hundred eighty-five. Wow. I I put in my order immediately. Um, there was a problem with my credit card, so I I called back and and I couldn't get an answer because they're in Germany. And then I sent him an email asking, is there a way for me to put this on another card or maybe double up cards or something so I can get this, this transaction through. Um, they didn't call, they didn't call me back. And then, so I called Sweetwater. I talked to my Sweetwater rep and I was like, look, I'm really interested. I really don't want to have to order one from Toman. I want a tape delay before they go out of stock. Now my fiendish plan on this was to get, get a tape delay and then just spend like 200 bucks on tapes. So I would have it for like 10 years. I was only going to use it at home or in the studio. It was not going to be like an always on thing. I was never going to gig it. Like it's never going to be that thing for me with, with 10 tapes or whatever. I could probably, I could probably use that thing for the rest of my life. Um, so I went and I, I, I had thought I had it ordered. I went to work 11 AM. I found out that it was not, the order didn't go through um, three o'clock that afternoon. I was talking to Sweetwater. I talked to my my rep. They had a Sweetwater didn't had had no idea what was going on T Rex. Nobody did. All they knew was that T Rex had declared bankruptcy. It had been published on the internet somewhere, and it was like a big deal. Um, they had they had contacted T Rex directly. Nobody had reached out to them. I got a good price from them. Um, it was not as good, not anywhere near as good as as Toman, but I was like, it's in the states. I don't have to pay shipping or import fees or anything like that. So I'll just do it. Um, Fast forward, like I told him, I said, let me know if they drop the price. I'm going to wait two days. I'll call you back and I'll order one. In the meantime, I went and I researched the uh, Replica Junior. And I found out it really wasn't a tape delay for me. Even though it is a tape delay, it, it, there's some things about it I don't like. It doesn't do slap back. The, the minimum delay time is 350 milliseconds. So it only goes between 350 and like a second and a half. Right. Um, it has some cool features. It still runs on tape. A lot of people say the tape warble is hard to dial out, which I like the crisp, like regular tape delay. I don't need a lot of the, the modulation. It's nice to have available, but you really can't dial it out. 
Um, and I, you know, their maintenance and stuff. So I just, at the end of the day, it just ended up being a pedal I didn't need, which is why I ended up ordering the wireless system. Cause I'm not a jerk. I knew that like they had pulled some strings to get me a good price. So I was like, all right, I'll call back up. I'll order something else to make it worth their while. Just show them I'm not screwing around and like being a nice dude. Cause I like my Sweetwater rep. He's a friend of mine. And, uh, I mean, to give, put it in perspective, I spent an hour on the phone with him when I ordered it because we were talking about different gear related things. Um, but uh, so long story short, um, I didn't end up ordering it. The day I backed out, it was it, actually the, the nail that put the, or the, the nail in the coffin was the tapes. He who controls the tapes controls the universe. If you saw me say that in the group, now you'll understand why. Just like tubes, when they started to go out of production, some enterprising people knew that people were going to be using tubes for decades. And so they bought all of the ones they could find. I know of a person who had a closet, like a pantry closet that was filled with audio tubes. I mean, when I say filled floor to ceiling, every kind of tube that you could possibly imagine that would go into a guitar amplifier. And they've been selling them through places like the tube store and other places and making a killing. Yeah. I also have heard of people who have put their kids through college selling old vacuum tubes yeah. um, out of their house or garage or wherever. So that's what's happened with these analog tapes. The tapes sold out faster than the units did. And you can't get tape anywhere for the, the T-Rex delays right now. Yeah. Fast forward, I, I, I ordered my Boss Wireless. That afternoon, guess what I saw? T-Rex is coming back. T-Rex is coming back. The two original owners killed the other part. They didn't kill the other partners, but they killed the deal with the other partners. They are financing retribution with the company. They're going to reorganize. They're going to restructure. And it sounds like T-Rex will be back on operation probably later this year. Um, the funny part is no word on what products will be coming back or whatnot. So the funny part about this whole thing is for all those guys that thought they were going to pull fast on everybody and buy all these tapes, I wouldn't be surprised if T-Rex doesn't come back, come back with more tape delays right. and continue producing tape. Yeah. And, and the silly part about the whole shenanigans is that the tape delay for them is probably a killer selling product because they're the only people doing it at a reasonable price. Your other option is full tone, thousand bucks or 2000 bucks. They have two models. So plus the, uh, the tapes I think are now 50 bucks a piece from them. Um, so for, you know, unless you're a studio rat or a gigging musician, it just doesn't make sense to buy uh, a tube echo anyway. So I've been exploring again, other tube delays. I have a helix. Uh, the tube sounds in it are okay. They're not terrible, but I think there are other pedals that do a better job. If you're looking for something super specific. Right. Um, so that's why I'm looking at the Strymon. It may end up that I get, I get one at, uh gear fest i don't know it's been a pedal that's been on my radar for like three or four years i've had the empress uh vintage tape thing i've had uh, a couple other ones and i mean it's i it's the one that every time i listen to the demos i'm like god that sounds good yeah um so i'll probably end up getting one <coughs> anyway um yeah any thoughts on tome and t-rex bankruptcy no nothing no i mean if i lived in europe i'd have thoughts on toman but i don't have any well uh, the people in the states don't like toman because they're a bitch to get information out of like they so european business does things differently we all know that and they like shipping uh actually kish who is now uh, off the call he's ordered from toman before and uh it took him weeks to get his item I, I I think over a month. So. Yeah, so I went to I went to order the little magnetic blue guitar things for the pedal board, right? Sweetwater. From Sweetwater. Yeah. And guess what? Out of stock. They're out of stock. Yep. So um I have, you know, thing notify me when stock. They're twenty dollars. All they are is pair of magnets with hole in them, right? Uh reach out to uh reach out to um uh him directly. That's what I'm thinking because I, uh, so I got his email. Let's do it. I got a, um, I, I was going to email him. I didn't want to email him about something so small. I mean, it's just like, God, no, no, no. Just be like, look, I need a pair of these, I need to send these magnets. 
Yeah. Like, is there any way I, I can just buy them direct from you? Right. So I went to, uh, I did a Google search because Toman came up. And uh, yeah, and I'm not buying from Toman. I'm not buying a $20 item and waiting six months when these will probably come back into Sweetwater next week. $35 shipping too. Yeah. And, thir- and 35 it's $13.99 from Toman. I'm like, oh, that's great. Because it said Toman US. I'm like, oh, they got a US distribution? No, they do not. No, they don't. And it was $35 in shipping for a pair of magnets. Do you know what's this crazy, though? Thing can't weigh, this thing can't weigh a pound. Anything you order from Toman is $35 shipped. Yeah. Anything. So you order 10 guitars, 35 bucks shipping. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hilarious. Ryan, Ryan Burke from 60 Cycle Hum ordered uh, a bunch of guitars from there after he came yeah. home from uh, Toman Gear University. Yeah. And uh, they were like, I, it's like 33 bucks, and he got like six guitars. I'm like, that's insane. That makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> Which makes you wonder if I order something over there that's like, like, like what you're looking at, like, you know, it fits in an envelope. And yeah. I, I'm paying $33 for, for ordering that because some other jerk ordered six guitars for $33. Exactly. And they got <laughs> that, sucks. Really- that sucks. They all they got to do is slip it into an envelope. And put no, the they, they, they know what they're doing. They, they're, they're not stupid. They're, they're, yeah. They'll put the $33 on there and hope that you buy something else to make it worth your while. That's right. And I won't. And then you wait six months to get it. I'll buy a pair of earth magnets and drill a freaking hole in them myself. <laughs> <laughs> now, call, uh, talk to, talk to um, him directly. Thomas, yeah. Th- Thomas will probably he might be a good, a good chance to connect with him before GearFest and just remind yeah. him we'll be there and stuff. Um, yeah. I love, I, I know he's probably got new products cooking because he, well, he's talking I, about no guitar is safe that he's got some stuff in the oven. Yeah. I don't know what his days is going to look like, but I'd like to get him to come over to the room and jam with us. And uh, <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. I think he's going to be busy as hell. Uh, I'm sure I would be, I would be fine with anybody that we meet there uh, coming to hang out with us, but they don't have to. Um, you're going to find out it's, it's hectic as hell. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. I it's, know. Sure. it's a little, it's a lot more laid back than Nam from from people i know who've gone um but it's it's still like they're there basically you know from from eight to five yep and then the the craziest thing was we, we had to walk to the parking lot that they have like two satellite lots and they and they actually shuttle people right, right. But we had to walk from the parking lot and uh it, i was driving to or i was driving out going back to the main road and i see paul rivera walking along the, the side of the road I'm like if i didn't have a car full of people i was like i'd pull over and give him a ride like this sucks nobody wants to walk <laughs> so it's a yeah and it's place. june in, let me tell you something it's june in in uh, fort wayne it's hot yeah it was it was pretty it was pretty hey, you know what actually it wasn't too bad when we were there really um i think it was right around 75 degrees yeah, it's hot enough you didn't want to stand out but all the tents are air conditioned Oh, that's so, nice. Yeah. Awesome. They're not horrible. Yeah, John asked if you got the uh, King of Tone or the Prince of Tone. I did not order a King of Tone. Prince of I Prince. talked about it in the show. It came up. I didn't order it. Oh, I thought you had ordered one and you were waiting one yeah. for one for quite a long yeah, time. I, thought I was the practical guitarist. So you can, oh, I think I do remember on one of the episodes you mentioned you canceled the order. I didn't cancel uh-huh. it. I never, I never paid because the way the, to- the King uh-huh. of Tone, the King of- if you want one, I can price to get you one. Um, the way the King of Tone system works, you put your name on a list, and then when it comes up, they send you the link to go buy one and a code that says, you know, you are who you say you are, yeah. and then you can go place your order. So technically, I think my code is still active. I can turn around and go order one right now. Um, but I just, I balked and I was like, you know, I was like, I don't need a $350 overdrive pedal right now. And I'm just going to turn around and flip it. And I don't want to do that to, to, to them. Cause they don't right, do right. That. like, I'm just, I'm trying to live my life. So I'm not a dick. Uh, and unfortunately I've done enough flipping <laughs> in my life that I probably should start considering, you know, thinking about different lifestyle choices. Um, and so I'm not going to flip one as much profit as there is in it. I'm glad I didn't do it. So anyway, we are uh, coming to the end of our episode here. Jim is, Jim is making the field goal sign for me. So I'm going to give him a sign. Um, <laughs> and uh, I actually, I have another sign. For I you thought today. PRS was the only one that had birds in it. No, I can't. you know what? I'm really mad right now because I have a, I have an index card over here. It has a very special message written for you. And I think, Oh no, you still read it. 
Oh, that's so yeah. sweet. I thought that was etched onto a pedal earlier. You no. know? <laughs> so we, nice catch. Uh, when we get done, I'm just going to show you here. So I got this, I got this guy wired up. Hey, um, let's end the episode. I'm getting ready to um, play over and over. I'm trying to play the fast part to um, uh, Journey's uh, Separate Ways World Apart um, while singing. Good luck. Yeah, yeah. I have to let me know how that goes for you. Yeah. Part in the, the <laughs> and let's just say that that's done in like four different positions in like a second and a half. That guy, I, there's no way I'm going to play that note for no. I'm just going to come up with something and just, just play. don't think about just don't think about positions. We're going to need to see that. We're going to yeah. need to see that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. It's, it's scary. I have the first part done. <laughs> the second part is not. Not. Before before we exit, I do want to say thank every thank uh, to thank everybody for getting us to the ten thousand download mark. Yes. Um, we really want to get people listening, and it's not because of anything other than you know we want we want to have a, 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 we want to have people think about these things, the topics we talk about on the show. Um, I feel like the material we present here is done in a different way. Uh, I feel like it may it may deviate from the normal guitar culture nonsense that you see in other places. And I'm not saying that to direct the, the gear slum, which their tag is guitar culture nonsense, but like there's a lot of people out there on these forums that say things that just simply either aren't true or aren't true for everyone or are right. uninformed. Right. Um, so Absolutely. Thanks everybody for tuning in. This is uh episode 112, I think. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad that we can have everybody join us tonight. Thank you for uh, sticking around till the end, John. I know we were here for a really long time. So, yep. all right. I have been David. I've been Jim. And tonight, with, along with John and Stephen and Dan, yeah. we have been the Practical Guitarists. <laughs> <laughs>